high prices. The administration has played the blame game, citing corporate greed and so-called shrinkflation. Some Democrats have even trained fire on you, uh, Chair Powell, blaming interest rate hikes, which were necessitated by Democrat spending uh, for the high cost and brazenly calling you uh, to make cuts prematurely. It's highly inappropriate for lawmakers to attempt to influence monetary policy. Chairman Powell, I have faith that you will not allow politics to cloud your judgment in the fight to tackle inflation. As I have always said, you are a steady hand, and I believe you are committed to the Federal Reserve's independence, as I am I. Uh, just as you have rejected the outside pressures of politically motivated agendas, I hope you will be just as attuned to the threats of politicization when, calling, when the calling is coming from inside the House. Vice Chairman uh, Barr's, Michael Barr's, so-called holistic <coughs> review of capital requirements and the fatally flawed Basel III in-game proposal represent a concerning trend of partisan proposals taking priority over, over supervision. This has real-world impacts, as we saw one year ago this month when the supervision and regulation arm of the Fed uh, was late catching up to the effects of the acceleration of interest rates on the banking system. Americans were understandably shaken by last year's banking turbulence. As we continue to monitor uh, potential instability, including bank exposure to commercial real estate, it's critical that the Fed keep its eye on the ball. This does not include enacting new, far-reaching, and ultimately harmful regulatory policy, though. As you know, members on both sides of the aisle, on this committee and in Congress, have made clear that the Basel III in-game proposal would be catastrophic for families, communities, and small businesses. Regulators uh, should uh, re withdraw it and start over. I think that's the proper course with something as deeply flawed as the current proposal. Additionally, given that other significant proposals would have to fit holistically together, regulators cannot simply proceed with them as separate modules or using a cut and paste uh, approach. Uh, most importantly, as the Basel III in-game proposal is discarded or altered, I strongly urge you and other regulators not to finalize your long, uh, the long-term debt proposal. Instead, Chairman Powell, I would encourage you to stick to the task at hand and follow the data the stakes are way too high to put politics over sound policy. With that, I yield back, and I'll now recognize the ranking member of the full committee. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome back, Chair Powell. While I am pleased by the progress the Fed and the Biden administration have made to tackle inflation, we're not out of the woods yet. In fact, even though my Republican colleagues refuse to acknowledge this fact, housing is still the number one driver of inflation. Based on the latest data, housing costs continue to make up nearly 70% of overall price increases, outpacing modest wage gains. This means that until we address the underlying housing supply shortage, Americans will continue to pay an increasing share of their income on housing. The affordability crisis will worsen and inflation will remain too high. With that said, it's hard to understand why Republicans feign concern about the economy when they're unwilling to address the key driver of inflation, housing. In fact, Republicans have only put forward legislation that makes things worse for millions of Americans including moving legislation to slash funding for federal housing programs, including in rural America, where homelessness is rising. This abysmal record on housing is par for the course for Republicans. Since they have been in the majority, they have convened only six hearings on housing, on top of launching baseless impeachment efforts censoring members and pushing our government to the brink of multiple government shutdowns, it's clear that Republicans are too focused on drama and chaos to drive, deliver anything for the American people. That's not how Democrats roll. When I was chair of the committee during the 116th and 117th Congress, not only did we hold 55 hearings on housings, but I and my fellow Democrats enacted 12 critical 
housing bills into law in the last Congress alone that helped stymie uh, to stymie of evictions, foreclosures, and homelessness, keeping millions of people stably housed during and after the pandemic. Unlike Republicans, we don't just talk about the issue. Democrats make law. As House Republicans continue to disappoint, committee Democrats are offering ev evidence-based solutions to keep a fair and affordable housing agenda at the top priority in Congress. That's why I and my Democratic colleagues reintroduce three groundbreaking bills to address the housing crisis and bring down inflation once and for all. This includes Housing Crisis Response Act, the Ending Homelessness Act, and the Down Payment Toward Equity Act. Together, these bills would create nearly 1.4 million affordable, accessible, and resilient homes, reduce housing costs in homelessness, and revive the American dream of home ownership for all. So, when my Republican colleagues are ready to get serious about our nation's economy and inflation, Democrats are ready to work with you to pass the bills into law. In fact, tomorrow at noon, I, committee Democrats, and more than 30 housing advocates will join together at a press conference to share just how important ending the affordable housing crisis is to the state of our union. And so I invite all of my Republican colleagues who say they care about this issue to come on and join us. I look forward to discussing this critical issue with Chair Powell today. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Chair recognizes Mr. Barr, Chairman of the Subcommittee on Financial Institutions and Monetary Policy for one minute. Welcome, Chairman Powell. Runaway inflation and increased interest rates still have Americans reeling. And while the rate of price increases have come down thanks to monetary tightening, the overall level of prices remain high. The toothpaste is out of the tube. And Americans, the average American family still is paying about $15,000 more for the same goods and services that they were purchasing just three years ago uh, before the Biden administration. So Americans have suffered years of eroding purchasing power in their paychecks. And while I'm pleased the Fed is resolved in getting inflation back under control, I'm not pleased by the numerous recent unjustified, politicized, and underanalyzed regulatory proposals. The Fed needs to withdraw and repropose the irredeemably flawed Basel III endgame proposal, especially given that 97% of public comments across the ideological spectrum express disapproval of the proposal. Chair Powell, I urge you to listen to the American people withdraw the Basel III endgame proposal and tell us today what the Fed's plans are moving forward. I yield. The Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Financial Institutions and Monetary Policy, Mr. Foster, for one minute. Um, thank you, Chair Powell, for um, being here today. Um, and I had a chance to actually read the monetary policy report from cover to cover, thanks to an exceptionally long airport delay, um, again, going back home last weekend. And um, the feeling I got again and again is that things are fairly well recovered from COVID and getting back to normal, that we're in the range where ordinary monetary policy and fiscal policy will allow us to satisfy your dual mandate. Uh, today, unemployment remains near historic lows. Core PCE inflation is down to 2.8% year over year compared to a peak of 5.6% in 2022. And the major stock indices are hovering around record highs. GDP growth continues to beat expectations, and the U.S. economy has added more than 14 million jobs since President Biden took office. The GDP itself is pretty much back on the trajectory that it would have been pre-COVID. U.S. manufacturers alone have added nearly 800,000 jobs, employing more workers now than any point since 2008. And so my lesson from that is that the fiscal response that we engaged in was appropriately tailored, and the soft landing is within sight. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Today we welcome the testimony of Jerome Powell, Chair of the, uh, the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors. As you know, we'll, you'll be recognized for five minutes for a summary of uh, an oral presentation of your in, in oral presentation of your uh, testimony. Without objection, your written testimony will be made a part of the record. Uh, Chair Powell, we're now recognized for five minutes. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and other members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to present the Federal Reserve's semi-annual monetary policy report. The Federal Reserve remains squarely focused on our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. 
the economy has made considerable progress toward these objectives over the past year. While inflation remains above the FOMC's objective of 2%, it has eased substantially, and the slowing in inflation has occurred without a significant increase in unemployment. As the labor market tightness has eased and progress on inflation has continued, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals have been moving into better balance. Even so, the committee remains highly attentive to inflation risks and is acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship, especially on those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. The FOMC is strongly committed to returning inflation to its 2% objective. Restoring price stability is essential to achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. I will review the current economic situation before turning to monetary policy. Economic activity expanded at a strong pace over the past year. For 2023 as a whole, gross domestic product increased 3.1%, bolstered by solid consumer demand and improving supply conditions. Activity in the housing sector was subdued over the past year, largely reflecting high mortgage rates. High interest rates also appear to have been weighing on business fixed investment. The labor market remains relatively tight, but supply and demand conditions have continued to come into better balance. Since the middle of last year, payroll job gains have averaged 239,000 jobs per month, and the unemployment rate has remained near historical lows at 3.7%. Strong job creation has been accompanied by an increase in the supply of workers, particularly among individuals aged 25 to 54, and a continued strong pace of immigration. Job vacancies have declined and nominal wage growth has been easing. Although the jobs to workers gap has narrowed, labor demand still exceeds the supply of available workers. The strong labor market over the past two years has also helped to narrow long-standing disparities in employment and earnings across demographic groups. Inflation has eased notably over the past year, but remains above the FOMC's longer-run goal of 2%. Total personal consumption expenditures prices rose 2.4% over the 12 months ending in January. Excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 2.8%, a notable slowing from 2022 that was widespread across both goods and services prices. Long-term inflation expectations appear to have remained well anchored, as reflected by a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. After significantly tightening the stance of monetary policy since early 2022, the FOMC has maintained the target range for the federal funds rate at 5.25% to 5.5% since its meeting last July. We've also continued to shrink our balance sheet at a brisk pace and in a predictable manner. A restrictive stance of monetary policy is putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. If the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. But the economic outlook is uncertain, and ongoing progress toward our 2% objective for inflation is not assured. Reducing policy restraint too soon or too much could result in a reversal of progress we've seen in inflation and ultimately require even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2%. At the same time, reducing policy restraint too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. In considering any adjustments to the target range for the, for the policy rate, we will carefully assess the incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. The committee does not expect that it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keeping longer run inflation expectations well anchored. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Federal Reserve will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Powell. Um, 
and I should have noted this at the outset, but this is your 25th testimony before uh, the U.S. Congress as chair of the Federal Reserve, and uh, we thank you for your service and your commitment to uh, congressional oversight. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, I'll now recognize myself for five minutes uh, for the purposes of questions. Uh, let's begin with uh, what's top of mind. We have two issues that are top of mind with the Fed. Regulatory policy with the Barr proposal, the Michael Barr proposal on capital, and interest rates. We're in a political year, and uh, the lens of a political year falls heavily on all government, all parts of government. Um, there's a lot of debate about uh, the, the past three years of high inflation and uh, impact on American families. And now that inflation is receding, there's been a great deal of speculation about what, what, when the Fed would cut rates. Some say that uh, it's going to be a lot of rate cutting this year. Some say none. Uh, what say you? I, I say that really it will depend on the path of the economy. Our, our focus is on maximum employment and price stability, and those the, the, and the incoming data as they affect the the, uh, the outlook. And those are the things we'll be looking at. I can go further if you'd like. Um, so, at what point will the Fed be forced to cut rates? What, what what does the data? What kind of data would you point to? And do you have any updates there? Um, so, uh, what we've said is that the committee would uh, would like to see more data that confirm and make us more confident that inflation is moving sustainably down to 2%. We have some confidence of that. Inflation, uh, headline inflation has moved down more than three full percentage points now to 2.4%, as I mentioned in my remarks. We want to see a little bit more data so that we can become confident and so that we can take that step of beginning to reduce policy rates. It's a very important step. We think because of the strength in the economy and the strength in the labor market and the progress we've made, we can approach that step carefully and thoughtfully uh, and, and with greater confidence. And when we reach that confidence, the expectation is we will do so sometime this year. We can then begin dialing back the restriction on our policy. Um, well, let's, let's pivot to regulatory policy. Uh, Chair Powell, as, as you know, there have been serious concerns expressed on both sides of the aisle. Um, and across America and across industries uh, about the Basel III in-game proposal that uh, Vice Chair uh, Michael Barr has proposed and that the Fed is taking up. Uh, the concern is on both process, meaning how the proposed rule was developed, analyzed, and released for comment, uh, the general concern of a lack of economic justification for these actions, um, and, um, and, but also on the substance. Um, the proposal goes f uh, much further uh, than the Basel III committee recommended on capital requirements, putting us at a great disadvantage internationally, potentially. Uh, so my first question is on substance. Is the Fed listening to these comments uh, that have been nearly, you know, uh, nearly unanimous in opposition to this rule? Um, and uh, are they, is the Fed listening to these comments on the impact the rule will have on everyday Americans? And what is the status on rulemaking, and what is the plan moving forward? So um, you're right. We've received voluminous uh, and very substantive comments, as well as the quantitative impact study, study that we put out. We got those responses in mid-January, and we're carefully analyzing them. We had asked for very specific, detailed, data-based comments, and I'm, I'm happy to say that we did, we did get that. So we're now just now reaching the stage where we can begin to make decisions about how to proceed. We really haven't made any decisions yet, but I, I think I can say a few things. First, we do hear the concerns, and, and I do expect that there will be broad and material changes to the proposal. Um, I, I'll add that I, I'm confident that the final product uh, will be one that does have broad support both at the Fed and, and in, in, in the broader world. Um, as far as process is concerned, we're really not at the stage of making uh, decisions about that. That's, can, that's down the road at least a bit. I will say the question we get is, is reproposal, and I will say that uh, we haven't made that decision, but if, if when we get to that point that turns out to be the appropriate thing, we won't hesitate to do it. You it's won't rule that option. out. You would not rule that out at this stage of the game, reproposal. Not at all. No, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very plausible option. It will depend on how things lie at the time when we reach that point. Okay, and there's a lot of concern about the interplay between different parts of the rule, and if you change one, what, what does the economic analysis look like for the new proposal? 
Um, so it is good to hear that you will be methodical and the Fed will do its traditional role of building consensus around the substantive changes. And that is your intention. That is, that is right. I, you know, I said this would be a thoughtful, deliberative process. It's, it's more important that we get this right than that we do it fast. We understand that. Uh, this is an important uh, rulemaking, and it's going to have you know, potential implications for the economy and the people we serve. We're going to take our time and do it right. Thank you, Chairman Powell. Uh, the ranking member, Ms. Waters, recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Chair Powell, I want to talk to you about housing, but before I get there, let me address an, uh, the issue of mergers. Last week, I led a letter along with 15 committee Democrats to you as well as DOJ, OCC, and FDIC expressing my strong concern about the lack of progress you have made in updating your bank merger review procedures. This is critical now that we just learned of another mega merger involving Capital One and Discover, which would create the sixth largest U.S. commercial bank with a major role in the credit card market. But far too long, experts have raised alarm that there is a rubber stamping process of bank mergers where virtually all applications are approved. All the while, unbridled market consolidation poses great risk to consumers and entrepreneurs. What is the status of your updates to the merger review process? And does the Fed plan to convene public hearings on the Capital One and Discover merger? So I think. I, I do, I believe we're in regular contact with the Justice Department on, on what's going on with their review of merger practices. Um, we are, we're looking at that and uh, considering. Um, I think on the, on the potential merger with, uh, that you mentioned, we haven't received an application, so there's really not much to say yet. Uh, we, we, uh, it's early days. When, when we do get that application, though, we're going to uh, evaluate that merger as always under the factors laid out under the law, and and that's uh, that's our commitment. So you do believe that your uh, bank merger procedures are ready to uh, do the work that's necessary when you evaluate uh, this possible merger. I do. And are you supportive of uh, of uh, organizing community hearings on this merger? We, we haven't even, I haven't talked about that with anybody. I will say this, we've done, we've, we've done that in many um, large mergers, but that's not, a, that's not a conversation we've had yet. We, we literally don't even have an application for the merger yet. Thank you. We'll stay in touch with you on that. Um, so turning to the national affordable housing and homelessness crisis, where we've seen steady increases year after year in home prices and rent costs, which are a symptom of the chronic undersupply of affordable housing. Indeed, more renters and homeowners are now spending more of their income than ever on housing costs. And as you know, housing costs continue to be a primary driver of inflation. Do you think the Fed has sufficiently emphasized the role that housing costs play in keeping us uh, from your 2% inflation goal? Do you think it's reasonable to believe that monetary policy can accomplish this goal without a fiscal policy response? And if you do, how long will it take to get there? Uh, housing uh, services inflation is one of the three components uh, that we look at that make up the core PCE and, um, index. And it has been coming down uh, from, from its heights of, of a couple years back. It's part of the story. I think the overall story is that goods price inflation has, has turned negative. Goods prices are actually coming down a bit. Uh, housing services inflation, uh, you can see from more, you know, currently entered into leases that as leases turn over, the increases are going to be smaller. So in, in our forecast and in, in everyone's forecast, housing services inflation comes down. It's and been that reported that the methodology services. used to assess housing costs as an indicator of inflation is imperfect. Namely, because it considers costs based on both new and old rent, including for owner-occupied housing on a month-to-month -month basis. This results in stale data, since families' housing costs typically do not change unless they move or their lease is up for renewal. So to address these imperfections in the housing cost indicators, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and uh, Cleveland uh, Fed 
created an improved methodology based solely on new lease rents, which is referred to as new tenant repeat rent, rex, uh, rent index. Has the Fed incorporated this new indicator into its economic assessments? If not, why not? And so what changes has it had on the level of housing inflation observed by the Fed? So we, we are, we're well aware of that, and we do incorporate it into our thinking. Uh, as I was starting to mention, uh, that is the reason, the fact that market rents are, are moving up at a much slower pace is the reason why forecasts do are for, for housing services inflation to come down, and that absolutely plays a role in our thinking. Thank you, and I yield back. Jolay yields back. The vice chair, Mr. Barr, is, I'm sorry. Wrong vice chair. <laughs> Wrong vice chair. Uh, the gentleman from Arkansas, the vice chair of the full committee, uh, Mr. Hill is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I want to welcome you, uh, Chairman Powell, to the committee. We're glad to, <clears throat> glad to have you back and your expertise. And I want to pick, off, uh, pick up where Chairman McHenry left off on his conversation about uh, Basel III Endgame. You made a good point saying you're not taking the whole concept of reproposal off the table as you review the analytics. And you all discussed the interactivity of that rule with other rules. <clears throat> So if you were to repropose uh, the Basel III endgame, would the Federal Reserve delay then the long-term debt proposal that's on the table? In other words, would you agree that the agency should not finalize this long-term debt proposal for bank holding companies until banks have a better understanding of what their capital obligations under Basel III endgame might be? So we, we haven't made the first uh, decision yet, so it's hard, I couldn't say definitively. But yeah, that's a question we'd be asking ourselves is, uh, is uh, what would be the implication for other rules, including the long-term debt. Well, and is the Fed considering changes to the requirement for regional banks uh, to issue long-term debt? Right now, it's stated to be issued at, the, at 6 percent of, of risk-weighted assets in abundance of caution in case there needs to be a, a resolution, obviously. We know the logic for it. But as I understand it, it's being required at both the holding company level and down at the bank level, and that seems redundant to me. Are you aware of that, and have you, have you considered changing that in your discussions? Yes, yeah, so that's another area where the, the comment period ended um, a, a little while back, and so once again, we're in the process of evaluating the comments. There will be a thoughtful, deliberative process around that. We welcome comments on, on these kinds of things. They're very important implications for the banks that are affected. We want to understand the effects, make sure we understand them correctly so that we can evaluate. percent increase in cost, real wages have actually fallen 2% over that period. So there's no doubt that inflation is the biggest issue facing American households. And uh, in my view, there's two principal or three principal causings. Certainly we had supply disruptions, but we've had unprecedented fiscal policy laxity. You described it in a recent interview as unsustainable. Uh, but we also think that uh, the Federal Reserve, in my view, and many people on this uh, committee commented, should have uh, re reduced accommodation after the pandemic sooner. One of the things coincident with that, which is what I want to talk to you about, is that the FOMC announced in August of 2020 this uh, flexible average inflation targeting framework. Right in the middle of the pandemic, which many of us didn't understand why the Fed would take that decision then, but it would give you flexibility on the 2%, saying the Fed could allow inflation to rise above 2% and stay there uh, above uh, that level for some time because the Fed had had such challenges in getting the price level to 2%. That was a major shift in the Fed's approach. Uh, do you think, in retrospect of now what we've witnessed over the past four years, that that was a mistake in hindsight to change that framework, and is it under review? So we, we said we would do a review on a, on a, on a five-year basis, and that means we'll be starting that review toward the end of this year. So we really haven't started. I do think that the question you raise will be one of the questions we look at. But the, the bigger question really is that that change in the approach um, was really based on the fact that we'd had very low uh, interest rates and very low inflation for a long period of time. And we, policy was always very close to the effect of lower bound, so there wasn't any firepower for central banks. And so it was a, it was a way to keep inflation expectations anchored at 2% and not have them slide down. Now we have entered a different period. The pandemic really may, may have changed that in a, in a sustained way. We, we, we don't know that yet, but that's the, the big question we'll be asking ourselves is, 
is the, is the effective lower bound to be thought of in a different way now? And if it were, that, that would have ramifications for our, for our uh, framework. But you know, we, haven't made, we haven't begun the review yet. It'll begin at the end of this year and probably end late the next year. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> gentleman yields back. We'll now go to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Powell, for, for being here. Uh, and I think I want to pick up a little bit right where we are. 2019, 2020, the entire world <clears throat> was under the unprecedented pandemic with COVID rate. Is that correct? Yes. At, at the time. And that changed a lot of things with reference because not just for the United States, but for the entire world. And it affected the economies of countries just about on the planet. That's not also correct? Yes. And um, supply chains were disrupted. Uh, in fact, I can remember many Americans and people around the world uh, could not get toilet paper or paper towels and some of the basics. <laughs> and so the prices, because of, the, you know, of, of supply and demand, skyrocketed, causing the inflation, not only in the United States, but basically all over the world. Is that correct? Yes. And so therefore, the Fed had to do certain things because of what we were in at that particular time. We couldn't just go back and act like the pandemic wasn't there. We had to do something to try to make sure that we were able to get through the pandemic. Is that not correct? Yes. And now we're at that point where we're about to get through this pandemic. And we can look at the rest of the world, what they did or didn't do at that time, but what we did at that time. And as a result of that, three years post the pandemic, when you look around the world, I think that you were correct with what you stated, that by most accounts, our economy is doing well. In fact, I would say our economy is doing better than most of the other countries in the world. Would you say that's correct? I would. And uh, so, you know, I would say then that some of the other countries of the world maybe should have looked at the policies that we put in place thereafter so that they could get out of it, so that they could be uh, have a labor market that is strong, where the unemployment rate is near a 50-year low. Uh, and as you've stated, inflation is also now coming down faster than any place else on the planet just about. Is that not correct? I think that's right, yeah. And, um, and, and I think that uh, you also recognize a mismatch between the strength of the economy, that's what we're talking about, in the field. And I think that uh, uh, Ranking Member Ward has touched on one of those big issues of housing, of which is now, you know, we're still trying to get, it, get, it, get, get, get that under control. And I think uh, the Ranking Member has some ideas on how we can do that, and that that may be something that you need to consider so that we can further get down uh, the uh, uh, inflation rate. And the other would be um, the commodity markets, because the cost of food is too high in people. So that's something else that we need to get in control. Is that not correct? Yes. And let me just ask this. Can you uh, say that there is a connection, for example, between conflicts in other areas of the world, like Russia's war against Ukraine and all the turmoil in the Middle East and the economic pressures that the United States feels, does that not also go into the reason why the cost of commodities can be still higher? Is there a connection therein, Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman? Certainly the war in Ukraine uh, caused commodity prices to move up sharply. So could you tell you what is the, you know, what, what, is the, what, what would the connection lead you to believe that there is an urgent need for us, I would think, for, you know, when we're running out of time, for us to do everything that is in our power in Congress to support Ukraine so that we can make sure that that and other strategic partners, uh, that we can help the commodities market, and that would help lower the cost of some of the commodities, bringing food prices down, if we would just be able to pass certain things that's going to help Ukraine right here in the United States Congress. Is that correct? Here's where it gets outside of our, uh, our jurisdiction. So we, we wouldn't, I wouldn't have an opinion on, on Ukraine funding. But if we had more grain that was going through, it wouldn't be, wasn't blocked by Russia, things of that nature, that generally just, well, you know, says that helps bring the cost down. Cost is higher because of the disruption in, 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 the, uh, in, in the Black Sea uh, that's ha happened because of this war. So that would help bring the cost down. That is not necessarily the policies just here in the United States, but that's the policy because of what's going on in Russia, and we need to make sure that we do something to prevent that if we really are serious about bringing inflation down. 
Is that not correct? I, I think it's correct that a full supply of grain would, would help with, uh, with, with commodity prices. And so, you know, instead of, uh, of us playing politics with this and acting like it is your fault or anyone else's fault that we had to go do and do what we did because of the unprecedented pandemic, what we did was save the economy then, knowing we got some problems that we had now, and now we are recovering quicker and better yes, than sir. any other country on this planet as a result of your policies Gen and the policies Gen of Joe Biden. Expired. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman Powell, thank you for testifying today. When you were before this committee a year ago, I cautioned against raising capital requirements on commodity derivatives <clears throat> that our agricultural and energy producers use back home to keep prices of food and power stable for consumers. At the time, you said that was a very specific concern and you weren't sure the proposal would even address commodity derivatives. And in fairness, that was before the Boswell proposal was officially published. Unfortunately, we now know that the proposal does impact commodity derivatives, and in fact, they are among the most penalized financial products that banks offer. And I would note for just a moment, I very much appreciate your comments uh, and responses to Chairman McHenry about the nature of the overall proposal. Congress wanted end users to be able to secure their hedges without posting margin to keep the derivatives markets affordable. But I've seen estimates that some of these types of transactions for end users could face 10 times the capital requirement. Chairman Powell, make me feel a little better. Ease my concerns here. Will you and the Fed work to fix this? Let, let me start by saying I, I, um, I want to echo the fact that our, our commodity markets and our capital markets are a huge national asset, and we need them to be functioning well and with as little friction as possible. I, I now understand that what you're referring to is the things that were done to in, increase capital requirements for various kinds of derivative activities. And I'll just say that's, that's an area where we're aware of the concerns and it's an area that we're taking a, a very close look at. I appreciate that. I was a member of the Dodd-Frank Conference Committee where there was bipartisan support to not disadvantage end users, farmers, ranchers, small businesses. This had broad bipartisan support then and still does today. Unfortunately, the Fed could undermine this longstanding work done by Congress. I'd like to enter a few letters into the record, Mr. Chairman, that discuss the detrimental impact to end users. First, a joint uh, Agricultural Trade Association letter from the American Farm Bureau Federation, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, among seven others. Next, a joint Energy Trade Association letter from the American Gas Association and four others. And lastly, a letter from the American Public Power Association and the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Powell, I'd now like to focus on how the proposal is set to significantly disincentivize banks from offering clearing services. In Dodd-Frank, Congress mandated central clearing as a way to reduce risk in the system. The number of banks that can clear derivatives for end users has reduced over time, making it harder for end users to find a bank to offer this service. There are some estimates that the Fed's proposal will increase capital for this activity by 80%. I'm worried that this will make it even harder for end users to find a bank to clear their hedges. This also comes at a time when the SEC, our friends at the Securities and Exchange Commission, has just finalized a rule in December that will increase clearing in uh, cost in treasury markets. This will have a real impact on market access and liquidity, not just in commodities, but the $26 trillion treasury market that plays a critical role in the world economy. Will you work with the CFTC to address this problem? Uh, I, again, I'll say that we're, we're, we're aware of those concerns and we're prepared to work with other agencies and also to make sure that our capital proposal uh, appropriately addresses them. The strength of central clearing is entirely dependent on banks' willingness to participate, and problems with the Boswell endgame warrant a full reproposal to give us time to appreciate their consequences. And there are real consequences, as you and I both know, Mr. Chairman. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, is recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, welcome again, Mr. Powell. It's an honor to have you before us today. I always enjoy hearing your commentary. Uh, as you know, recession and inflation, these are buzzwords and they are used in some circumstances to cast a, a, a dim light on perhaps the Fed and others who are working to, to end some of these uh, troubling circumstances we're dealing with. Are you now at a point where you believe that there will not be a recession? Uh, there was much talk about recession and many people worried that we would find ourselves having to negotiate our way out of a recession. What is your position currently on a recession? So um, U.S. growth last year was in excess of 3%. What we're seeing so far this year is continued solid growth. My expectation and that of other forecasters and of my colleagues is that we'll see continued growth at a solid pace. I will say so there's, there's no evidence or no reason to think that the U.S. economy is in or in some kind of short-term risk of falling into recession. Having said that, though, there's always a, a, you know, a, prob a possibility, a meaningful possibility that, that a, an economy will fall into recession. I don't think that, that that possibility, though, is elevated at the current time. Thank you. I, I appreciate your saying this because we want to, at some point, eliminate a great deal of fear associated with the, just the term recession. Next point, um, the uh, December FOMC projections showcase a slightly lower unemployment rate than last June's projections and slightly higher GDP, suggesting a soft landing remains like, likely. Uh, are you of the opinion that we're headed to a soft landing, Mr. Powell? I'll just say that um, what we've seen so far is an economy that's growing at a solid pace. We, we're seeing a labor market that is still tight, still strong. Wages are moving up, um, but the, the labor market's coming into better balance between supply and demand. And inflation has come down sharply, really, since the middle of last year. So. Those are the conditions we see. They're very attractive conditions, and we're trying to use our policies to keep that growth going and to keep that labor market strong while also achieving further progress on inflation. That's, that's our goal. And uh, I, do I think there's a possibility we can achieve all of that while keeping the labor market strong and the economy growing? Yes, I think there is a possibility. Indeed, that is what we're trying to achieve. A soft landing can be difficult to identify. Uh, we could possibly have a soft landing and, and uh, miss the point at which the landing took place. How, how do you uh, define the soft landing such that a member of the public, a lay person, would understand that we have indeed been, had a soft landing? So we, we really think about it in, in the terms I just dis discussed, which is we want to keep the economy growing, we want the labor market to remain strong, 3.7% uh, unemployment is pretty near 50-year historical lows. And we want inflation to continue to move down closer and closer to that 2% objective. And we've made you know, quite good progress on that over just the past year. So we want to continue those conditions. And I, I don't want to put the label on it. Other people can do that. But uh, I, I would just say we're using our tools to you know, keep a strong labor market and strong growth while you know, making further progress on getting inflation down to 2% for the benefit of the public. That's the economy that we, we're trying to achieve, and I, I think there's a, you know, we're on a good path so far to be able to get there. Well, I, I concur, but I would ask this as my last question. Will there be some announcement at some point that we've had a soft landing? Uh, because we have people who are continually indicating that we are not having a soft landing, there's a possibility of a recession. So will there ever be some official statement uh, that would give people some comfort? 
I'm not, I, I don't think by us, no. I think we're just going to keep our heads down and do our jobs and try to deliver what, what, we're, what the public is expecting from us. We, we wouldn't be, you know, declaring victory like that, but... Um, the gentleman's so. time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank the you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Chairman, welcome back. Uh, I think we enjoy this. <laughs> I hope you do, too. I know there's some bit of trepidation about all the things that are available to us and you to, to answer. You know, I learned a long time ago on a campaign trail, every problem can be solved on a campaign. Reality is a little bit different. Um, welcome back, despite all that. Um, looking at the Monetary Policy Report, March 1st, 2024. And as I review this, I would like to focus on the term that I would say, high prices are here to stay. Because what I've heard you say today in this report really go to is, you got everything under control, but it's, we're gonna keep the high prices. And I think the high prices really take a toll on the American people, as you're hearing from our colleagues, no matter whether they be Republican or Democrat. Uh, page seven of your report, you don't have to go focus on it, says, while current services, core service price inflation has been slowing, but remains elevated. It does. Uh, labor costs, as you know, and energy costs are a driver to your monetary policy. Uh, the question that I have is, because you began referencing policy, uh, two weeks ago or so, the president announced that he was going to slow down uh, the, uh, the gifting of opportunities in Texas for natural gas to be able to continue the exploration. And this in Texas is a trillion dollar answer problem to us because if we do not constantly go find through these uh, new finds, but also through the pro permitting process, we're in trouble. But we're also putting in trouble our contracts that we have with Germany and a lot of other countries. This is going to mean also that business in America continues to have high prices because as you know, wages are already high and now energy is high. There's no resiliency to continue this and see the American people win. You talked about policy. So what's your advice to policy about energy and what this administration is doing on a policy perspective? Um, we have you know, broad, significant, important uh, responsibilities, but we're really not responsible for energy policy, and we try to avoid commenting on... Uh, but it has a huge impact for. on this report. It arbitrarily keeps prices high. It, it arbitrarily means that business is not, while they're making money, and while households, people do buy that, it's diminishing their long-term advantages to make progress. So you're, you're just going to leave that alone? Really not appropriate for us to comment. I, you know, on if, it's, if I'm commenting on energy policy, I should comment on everything. You know, it's, it's, well, we have a you, mandate which is maximum employment and price stability. We take decisions by the legislature and by the administration as a given. We're not in charge of second guessing them. It's just not our job. Okay, well, all right, let's say we're not going to second guess them. I will. Uh, I believe that the energy policies that this president and, and the Democratic Party have supported are causing a huge uh, boom in prices staying high. They will not come down. A boom in, in attacking the uh, energy industry. Uh, jobs that are associated with it, our foreign policy as it relates to contracts that we have signed with foreign countries, giving up the natural gas market almost entirely on a world market to Qatar. It has a huge uh, impact on whether we are going to keep prices high or control these prices. 
it has a huge impact on, I think, your monetary report about how many houses get built, how many jobs get filled, whether we have jobs in place, whether we continue to have more jobs available than workers that are there, because over-regulation is having a lot to do with the nervousness, not only on this panel, but also by the American people. It would be my hope that you would pass some sort of a memo and tell them you have no opinion, but you want them to see what the impact is. I want to thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Heim, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Chairman Powell. Thanks for being with us today. Um, I have a question, but I want to start by uh, acknowledging, not celebrating, but acknowledging what has been a really remarkable soft landing in our economy. And I'm not celebrating because the American people, consumers, are still feeling the effects of high prices. Wages haven't caught up with prices in some instances. But I think that uh, it would be fair to say that observers would never have predicted the uh, conduct of this economy. You yourself said it in the final uh, press conference of 2023 when you said a very high proportion of forecasters predicted very weak growth or a recession. Not only did that not happen, we actually had a very strong year. So I want to acknowledge that and acknowledge your commitment to independent monetary policy. And because I'm still burdened with this idea that truth and facts matter, I want to point out, especially having listened to my good friend Mr. Sessions talk about the energy market, truth and facts matter. We are producing more oil and natural gas today than any other country on the planet. We are the world's number one energy producer. I could spend my entire five minutes sort of pointing out facts. The fact I want to point out here, and this comes right out of the report, is that the premise that inflation is Joe Biden's fault, is fiscal policy's fault. First is faulty because half the physical sti fiscal stimulus that occurred in the face of the pandemic happened under the previous president, Donald Trump, and it has faded, and this report makes the case. Core, and I quote from it, core goods prices have been declining as supply bottlenecks ease and import price inflation falls. So, Mr. Chairman, I don't want you to comment on that because it gets a little bit political, but I do think it's important that we keep some foot on the uh, plane of facts. I do want to ask you a question, though, uh, Mr. Chairman, because I always worry um, about risks, risks that we see and risks that we don't see. Um, and I want to use the remainder of my time uh, to talk about a risk you're very conscious of, which is the overhang in the commercial real estate market. As you know, the Financial Stability Oversight Council uh, identified commercial real estate as perhaps the most salient risk to the financial system, six trillion roughly in loans, half of that on bank balance sheets. Um, in a 60 Minutes interview a few weeks ago, you characterized distress in the commercial real estate market as sizable but manageable. Do you still feel like that risk is manageable? Do you feel like you've got the visibility and the transparency and the tools to address it? It makes me nervous because this has echoes of 2008, 2009, when vacancy rates com were declined relatively rapidly. We're not seeing that right now. So, so how do you feel? Is that, does that risk continue to be manageable, and do you have the tools to manage it? Yeah, I would say yes to that. I think um, I think it is manageable, and we've been you know working hard to management for some time now, really. Um, and you know what it really is is it's a lot of downtown real estate where, where where there's too much office supply because of work for home, work from home, and also you know the kind of downtown uh, retail that that is no longer as profitable, and things like that are really at the heart of it. Um, so what we've done is we've, um, we've looked at banks that have significant concentrations, and we've been in touch with them to make sure that they have a plan to deal with that. Uh, there will be losses by some banks. It isn't really the big banks. It's really medium and small-sized banks that have these higher concentrations. Um, it's going to be with us. It's a problem we'll be working through, I think, for several years. And uh, the idea is you've got to have enough capital, enough liquidity, and a plan to you know, take the losses that you're probably going to take, and uh, and so that's what we're doing. We're we're very active in in this space with small, medium. So, so let me ask banks. you about that. Sorry to interrupt, but let me ask you about that. Silicon Valley Bank, <clears throat> wild irresponsibility inside the bank, egregious irresponsibility on the part of corporate treasurers who put so much on deposit. 
The Fed also had some self-examination to do because the examiners and the supervisors of the bank, quite frankly, were not doing what they should have been. So we might be forgiven for being a bit skeptical of claims of being on this. What, what has changed in the uh, context of Silicon Valley Bank that gives you the confidence that the supervisors and the examiners will be on top of this? I, I see it with my own eyes, but but you know, I mean, frankly, there, there's there's a risk that we would overreact to something as de as as significant as that. It's it's not like we wouldn't have reacted very very strongly to what happened with, with Silicon Valley Bank, and we have. Uh, so I, I know that our, our supervisors are out there, and we're you know we're hearing back from uh, from from uh, you know media reports that we have been engaged with medium and small sized banks principally on this. So I, I am confident that we're doing the right things there, uh, and, I, and I do believe it's a manageable problem. If that changes, you know, then I'll, I'll, you know, I'll say so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll back. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Prowl, for being here today. I'd like to associate my remarks, or myself, with uh, Mr. Hill's remarks earlier with regards to the FDIC proposed long-term debt requirements that are based on the risk weighting of assets. I think it's an ill-thought-out proposal, and hopefully uh, your position on FSOC, you'll be able to advise them and hopefully guide them that this is going to be, gonna be um, held up until we actually get a, a, a Basel III rule. Um, in October 23, uh, in 2023, the board issued a proposal to update the debit interchange fee cap and regulation II. This is very concerning, given the data from both the GAO and Fed's own studies show that Reg II has significantly harmed access to free checking and other banking services for the country's poorest citizens. Yesterday, I introduced the Secure Payments Act, which would prohibit a rulemaking, final rulemaking until the Fed, among other things, studies the impact of the board's proposed rule completes a quantitative impact analysis specifically as it relates to affordable banking services for low-income Americans and reports those findings to the Congress. I understand the Fed acted here because you feel you're facing litigation, but I urge the board to proceed with extreme caution with any type of price control proposals, especially since the first iteration was so clearly harmful. Chairman Powell, knowing of the hardship caused by this policy on low-income consumers, does it give you any pause to continue down this road? As you know, um, the, this rule is out for comment. We extended the comment period to uh, May 12, so we don't have all the comments le uh, yet. We'll evaluate them carefully uh, and uh, you know, make an assessment. I mean, the, the law does assign us a specific job, which is to assess whether an interchange fee received by a large debit issuer for processing a debit card transaction is reasonable and proportional to issuer costs. This is the obligation that Congress has bestowed upon us not something we thought we sought, but that's our obligation under the law, and we don't know what else to do than to keep doing it uh, for as long as that's our assignment. And that's, that's all we think we're doing. And, but I think that the concerns that have been raised will, will be things that we... Well, hopefully you'll, you'll study this and understand yes, that will. from the previous types of rules along this line, they were very detrimental to a lot of low-income middle-income uh, folks. Um, as you know, the price reductions that were promised during the Durban Amendment, for instance, um, the added profits actually went from to, to the largest retailers rather than go to the uh, consumers, as they were, were, were talked about. 98% was one of the studies that showed that the retailers kept all the money instead of lowering prices as they were, told, were telling us they were going to happen. Um, so I'm very concerned about that. Um, so what, what's the legal basis for updating your regulation? You've talked about it a little bit. You believe that there is something in the law that says that you need to be doing this updating all the time, or should you be studying it before you actually propose a rule and make all these things uh, more appropriate? Well, again, I think I think our reading of the law is that it, that it, it, you know you, it's not something you do once and, and leave it there. Uh, it, it's supposed to be um, reasonable and proportionable to, issue, to a certain identified issue or costs, the implication being there, if those costs change, then, then this should change. So that, that's our reading. Um, you know, I think we do a lot of work. We, we waited a long time to change it. It's been many years since we did change it, but we do quite a bit of work to one of the things, make this assessment. And we'll, we'll review the comments and the data that we get. Very one of the things I hope that you consider is the fact that even though it's, it's supposed to be on $10 billion and up, <clears throat> stuff all rolls downhill, and as the last study showed, the, the smaller banks, the community banks, are also feeling effects of this. So be sure and consider that when you start talking and, and thinking about this. I, I appreciate that. Um, 
You know, one of the things, I, yesterday I had two, two different uh, foreign banker CEOs in my office, and they, they brought it, one of them brought up the subject to me, which is very concerning with regards to artificial intelligence, uh, being able to impact financial institutions in this country and our, and our banking system. And I tell people, I said, you know, think about this for, for a second. You know, you find some individual who is a well-known individual, perhaps Larry Kudlow, Dave Ramsey, uh, Bloomberg, somebody who has got credibility, and suddenly you see an artificially produced advertisement or Facebook post, and this person says, look here, we've got 100 banks that have got a problem today. Now, that individual didn't do this. It's artificially pr produced. I've seen a commercial already with the individual. You couldn't tell the difference between that individual and, 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 and the real thing. We have just come through the Silicon Valley situation. And if you have real-time payments, the Fed now, where you can instantaneously transfer money, and you have people scared to death by some well-known individual through an artificial intelligence situation, and I can tell you that China is watching this like a hawk. They are ready to pounce on this situation. To me, I've got some bills that actually would solve the problem. Do you think there's some, there's some issues here we need to be taking a look at? Yeah, I, I think we're we're very focused on um, AI. Like, I mean, many government agencies and and law enforcement agencies in particular, it's it's very challenging. You 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 paint one picture. There are lots of pictures. Gentlemen's time has expired. It's interesting now because the, four, the foreign Gentleman's banks are actually watching this. Thank you. We'll uh, we'll now go to the. A uh, gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Garcia, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, Chairman Powell. Thank you for being with us this morning. It's always a delight to have you uh, before us. Chair Powell, the February Congressional Budget Office report estimated that the U.S. economy will grow an estimated $7 trillion <clears throat> over the next decade, thanks to the, in large part to the surge in immigration, creating a larger labor force. Immigration also increases demand for goods and services. Can, I know you mentioned in your, your report that, um, that the growth sometime during COVID was held down due to some restrictions in, in uh, COVID and uh, restrictions on immigration. Can you detail how immigrants have been fueling our national growth? And did you consider uh, this report from the CBO in this current report? So um, I, I am very familiar with the CBO report. I've read the demographic projections and I've read the economic projections, so I do understand what they did. And that so you do making, agree with a seven trillion growth in the next decade? I don't. I have no judgment on that. I, I haven't tried to make a parallel assessment, but I'm, I'm familiar with the assessment. What they're doing is they're saying more people, more people working, uh, bigger economy. Uh, and and it, it, it makes the economy bigger. It, that's, it's just arithmetic. If you say that if you add a couple million people to an economy, they'll and and a percentage of them will work, then there will be more output, and there that's what they're showing. I, I wanted to. I just want to be very very clear though that we don't make immigration policy. We don't comment on immigration policy indirectly or directly. No, well, I'm not asking you to do that, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm simply asking if. If you, you agree that the immigration surge has added to a strong labor force, uh, which is necessary, I think you said that uh, we, we, we expect a, a continued growth at a solid pace. So be, to be able to continue on a solid pace, then we need that labor force. Wouldn't you agree? Well, so last year we got um, a big increase in workers, and it came from two sources. One was uh, participation increased uh, from people who were already here. And in addition, we got a significant increase in immigration. And many of those people uh, take part in the, in the working economy. And so there was a big increase in, in labor supply. That will, have, that will have increased output. It will have uh, made more people. It will have all kinds of economic effects. I'm just reporting the facts there. Right. I'm not, I'm not gonna say anything is needed for the future or good policy. Or, indirectly or directly, but I mean, I think it's just reporting the facts to say that immigration and, and labor force participation both contributed to the very strong uh, economic output growth that we had last year. Right. Is it possible for the Fed to conduct a formal assessment into the positive impact immigrants have on our economy and report back to Congress? Not really, no. I think that's that's a job for the CBO. We, we, we wouldn't, um, we don't, that's precisely what the Congressional Budget Office does, not what we do. All right, but the other question that, that you've not addressed is, did you consider um, the CBO's assessment 
that the growth in the next 10 years would be seven trillion and about one trillion in added revenues. Was that considered in this report? Because that was the February report, and this, I believe, is through February 29th. So the, I think that the answer to your question is 10-year growth projections by CBO don't have big implications, don't have any implications really for the current stance of monetary policy. But I will say okay. that, that the immigration that we saw was it was a you know a notable factor of the 2023 and 2024 economic um, outcomes, and of course we're aware of that, and it plays a role in our thinking about appropriate policy and the path of the economy. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, and related to that, I know that the last time that you were here, you and I talked about diversity and um, uh, diversity and inclusion efforts. Uh, both at the Fed, and I applauded you, and, and uh, well applauded the, the president for his appointment of Dr. Adriana Kubler. I expect to visit with her uh, this week. What other strategies and, and, and programs are you using uh, in the Fed, not only in here, but, but in all the, the branches to ensure that, that, uh, that there is diversity and inclusion? So in terms of um, intake of people, when we uh, go to hire a new, when the reserve banks go to hire a new president, those processes are, are very focused on, on having a diverse applicant pool, and we now, you see the results of that more and more over the years. Uh, that happens. Um, we don't have any role in appointments of governors, so that's not our job. The administration does that. Um, General, in terms of, you know, I'll just say internally, you know, we're very focused on having an open and inclusive uh, place to work. Uh, and also in hiring, we work hard to, to you know, to, to have diverse. Gentlemen, time is The gentleman Mr. from Chairman. Michigan, Mr. Heising, is now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Powell, uh, good to see you in person. Um, I, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I've, I've got to make a comment here. I just, it's, it's stunning to me that uh, equating an underground economy, which is very different uh, than, and not a healthy alternative uh, to the regular economy, uh, and basing that on an illegal workforce that's not legally able to work ultimately will fail. That, that is not a strategy to my colleagues on the other side. So um, just ask any farmer who's going to then have somebody, a regulator, come in and fine them for employing people who are not legally allowed to be here in the country. That is one of their greatest fears. So that's, that's just a fallacy of, of growth within this economy that is not sustainable. Um, Chair Powell, um, I, last fall I sent uh, Vice Chairman Barr a letter expressing my concern over the cumulative impact pending rulemakings governing products and services will have on consumers. Uh, this morning, uh, there's been a fair amount of time spent on Basel III, but among the agencies, and here I'm including Fed, FDIC, OCC, CFPB, and uh, the number of pending uh, or final rules is frankly just staggering. Regulators last year finalized new rules for the Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, the Fed is also looking at Reg II, which in my opinion would, uh, would unintentionally undermine recent significant progress in bringing low and moderate income consumers into the mainstream banking system. And just yesterday, the CFPB, uh, CFPB unveiled a rule uh, that would cap late fees uh, for banks. And I just literally walked out of a meeting with, uh, with my credit unions who are very concerned about uh, uh, those, uh, those things that may be in their future as well. So uh, I think it's critical that we don't look at any of these rules in a vacuum, and we need to consider their total impact and full scope on that. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. I've asked some of the other regulators, how much do you, as the Fed, and you personally consult with other agencies on their own rulemaking agenda? Do you coordinate? Do you talk? I, so I don't lead that area of our, of our business, but um, I know there's a lot of talking. I, I, coordination, I'm not sure there is coordination. Uh, we're, we're in government. There's always a lot of talking. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking. concerned about the, uh, about no the coordinating. Shortage. All right, well, let me ask you this way. Uh, when a rule is finalized under another regulator, are you mandated or have any kind of policy to go back and look at your other pending rules under your uh, purview and see if changes need to be made because of these other agencies' uh, rule, rule makings? There's no mandate like that. I think where it made sense to do that, though, we would, we would do it. But you have genuinely have some sort of review of that. It's conscious. I don't think there is a formal review. Okay. Of, no. Um, I've heard repeatedly that elements of Basel III overlap with the federal, the Fed's annual stress tests. Uh, what are you going to do to, to address that overlap? 
So we're, I mean, we're in the middle of, uh, of uh, just at the beginning, actually, of deciding what to do about Basel III. And part of that may be the interaction with the stress test. So I, I haven't got anything for you on that today, but that's, that's certainly an issue that presents right. itself. We'd, we'd like to continue that conversation. Um, I do want to touch on the bank failures of last year very quickly. Um, do you think that the banks that ultimately needed uh, the government bailout lacked sufficient capital, or was it more of a management problem? So with Silicon Valley Bank, it wasn't, it wasn't really, a, could they have used more capital? I mean, they were actually raising capital. It was a capital raise that they announced that triggered the run and everything. So you can argue that it needed more capital, but I wouldn't say that that was the proximate cause, really. It was, it was a, a funding structure that was all about uh, too, too much concentration of... Uh, yeah. Of, uh, well, many, sure many of us are, I'm asking the question because many of us are very concerned that uh, those failures are being used as, as an excuse to raise capital <laughs> standards across the board. Um, the, uh, uh, and because the SEC just released its, uh, its climate disclosure rule this morning, uh, I'm going to touch on the climate-related uh, question for you. Uh, uh, FSOC, uh, the FSOC chair has repeatedly stated that climate change is, quote, an ex existential threat. Presumably a threat that is existential affects banks and financial institutions of all sizes. Uh, why then have FSOC member regulatory agencies, including the Fed, limited their guidance on climate-related risks only to large financial institutions? Why not everybody? Well, it's a new thing, and you know we are not. It's a heck of a new thing. Yes, we're not climate change policymakers. It's you know th this is Either something is that SEC, needs to be handled yeah. by elected representatives, and so. We're starting this, this very carefully with large institutions who are already doing it, by the way. The things that we're doing, they, they're doing this because to remain active internationally, they have to be doing it. So we started with them because they understand it. Imposing it on smaller banks I'm, uh, is not something I'm for. Yep. Gentlemen, right. gentlemen's time has expired. We'll the be gentleman, following up on the Taylor rule. So. The gentlelady from Michigan is recognized for five minutes. Ms. Salib. Thank you so much, Chairman. Thank you, Chair Powell, for being here. Uh, do you agree? Uh, with the April Federal Reserve report that compensation incentives contributed to Silicon Valley's bank failure? I'm sorry, did, did I, I? So the April Federal Reserve report, it said that compensation incentives contributed to the Silicon Valley bank's failure. Do you agree with that? I would say it's at best a tertiary factor, but it probably had something to do with it. For me, not a major. So that's no? That's very small. Okay, so it did, okay. So do you agree the appropriate rules on incentive compensation could have reduced the likelihood of Silicon Valley's failure? Maybe, you know, if they didn't take no, all that money. I really money. don't think so. I mean, so I, they I, didn't don't take all that a, money. I, I don't think it's a first order question for Silicon Valley. A lot went wrong there. Yeah. Incentive comp would they be They actually blame you guys. They blame, they, blame, they blame the oversight, even though they didn't respond to your That's correspondences. We, we took our medicine. Yeah. Do you think it also has something to do with the fact that Section 956 of the Dodd-Frank rule hasn't been finalized by you? No, I don't. You don't think it's the reason? I don't. You don't think it's because people made money off of the failure? I think nothing. You don't think money drove them to do what they did? I, I didn't say that. I did, what I said, you know, there, there are lots so of... So they made money from it. They, they actually... It was I a lottery for them, right? I think that incentive compensation arrangements were at the heart of the Silicon Valley Bank failure. No. Okay. Do you support a robust rulemaking for executive compensation, Chairman? Oh, I, I, know that the, I know that the... Oh, you don't? I'm sorry? Oh, I'm just, this is, do you support robust rulemaking for executive compensation? Do you, do you believe in Section 956? Section 956 is the law. As I understand it, the agencies are looking at doing something. It, it's been 12 or 13 years, right? Yeah, multiple Nothing agencies. Has happened. Yeah. It's been hard to get it done. I lived through the last episodes of trying yeah. to get it done. So, so do you believe in a robust I, I rulemaking believe, process for executive compensation? I do. I do, yeah. Oh, great. Oh, that's awesome. Um, will, you com will, will you commit to helping finalize the Dodd-Frank section of 956 this year? Uh, I, I wouldn't it's been 12 that. years, Chairman. Yeah, no, I want. It played I, a role in the bank I, failure, Chairman. If I can answer, I, what I would like to do is. So understand. you don't want to do it this year. I mean, I'm being serious. What, do you, what you're saying? No. If the member will allow answer. the witness to answer the question, we've had a good day today, and the gentleman's trying to answer the question. 
I would like to understand the problem we're solving, and then I would like to see a, a proposal that addresses that problem. Okay. Do you believe people should profit off of bank failure? The executives that made those decisions? No, not not, not They the should not profit. Well, I, I would say executives who are responsible for a failed bank should, should not profit from the failure. Absolutely not. So they get to walk away with compensation based on their failure? Well, you're asking, true, you're asking about a, 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 a different rule that would do have clawback and things like that? Yeah. But, yeah, so that, that's that's something I know you've been looking at for, for a while. Yeah. That's, that's certainly an appropriate thing to look at. Yeah, because it's just going to continue to happen, is my opinion. It doesn't have to be yours. But it sure sure the heck could have helped here if they knew they were going to not, they were going to walk away, if they could walk away with not the bonuses, the compensation. I mean, they made money, a significant amount of money for their bank failure. Last question, Chair Powell. Do you believe that the impacts of climate change pose a risk? Have you been talking about that more? Uh, I, I certainly believe that climate change is real and poses risks over the longer term, sure. So there have been some that say, you know, higher interest rates um, it actually makes it more difficult to build out the renewable energy projects and other investments required to prevent climate impacts. Do you believe that to be true? Uh, you know, it's, it's not our, it, I, I believe that we need to do our job that you've assigned us, which is maximum employment and price stability, and we do it through interest rates. I, it's, it's not our job to consider the effect on climate change of that, and I think any, any effect on climate change of that would be kind of minuscule. Okay. Uh, last question, Chair Powell, do you, who do you see as the major winners and losers from high interest rates in terms of income groups, age groups, and racial or uh, other demographics? So uh, the point of high interest rates in the current environment is to bring inflation under control. The people who are hurt the most by inflation, as you know, mm -hmm. are people who are on a fixed income, who right away are in trouble when the cost of transportation, food, energy, and when those things go up, mm -hmm. they don't have financial resources to deal with it. Have you we're accountable to, to, yeah. to, to provide price stability to the American people. Those people benefit the most over time from stable prices. Thank the ladies' time's expired. We'll go to the gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, for five minutes. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you, uh, Chair Powell, for your service. I want to associate myself with the comments of my colleague, Mr. Himes. Uh, I am concerned about banks' commercial real estate exposure, and um, and I, I do hope that the Fed is doing everything it can to ensure that the exposure that these banks have will continue to be, in your words, manageable, because this this is a, a, a looming crisis um, out there, given the workplace changes and dynamics. Chair Powell, in remarks on Bloomberg, uh, Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary during the Obama administration, stated that, and I quote, it would be much more productive for our central bank to be focused on the question of real estate portfolios in the banks they supervise than, quote, some of the more abstract and politically driven arguments that about various kinds of capital charges on the largest banks. Do you agree, sir, that it would be more productive for Fed supervisors and regulators to keep their eye on the ball, um, in this case, commercial real estate and other real estate investments? I absolutely think we need to keep our eye on the ball on, on commercial real estate. And, uh, you know, I think we're doing that. I hope so. According to your semi-annual report, the median of members on your Monetary Policy Committee estimate that your target overnight interest rate will average 4.1% in 2024. Does that mean that the median number of members anticipate that you will be cutting interest rates sometime this year by as much or more than a full percentage point? No, it doesn't mean that. Uh, the, actually, the, the same, uh, the summary of economic projection showed a median of, this is in the December FOMC, so this is now three months old, showed three rate cuts this year. So that, was, that would be 75 basis points, three quarters of one percentage point. You were quoting the next year's number, so you would add that on. That was, that was through 2025, I believe. Um, so, so are you an anticipating that there would be more cuts so what you're coming? It's not the way I would say it is. You know, we're making economic projections, and so we write down your, a path of growth, what's happening in the labor market, what happens with inflation, and what goes with those forecasts is 
and appropriate uh, monetary policy, appropriate interest rates. So we expect inflation to come down, the economy to keep growing, the labor market to remain strong. And if that's the case, it will be appropriate for interest rates to come down you know, significantly over the coming years. Good. What, what will really happen, though, it's not a plan. What will happen is actually what, what the economy needs. The economy will do something different from that, and that's what will actually happen. Uh, Chairman Powell, 15 members of Congress, including myself, Ranking Member Sherman, Chairman Barr, and Ranking Member Foster sent a letter to the prudential regulators regarding the impact that Basel will have on U.S. capital markets activities. The letter highlighted critical areas of our U.S. markets, including securities underwriting, securitization, and derivatives that will be severely impacted by the Basel proposal. This was also a common theme represented throughout the comment file on the Basel proposal, over 95 percent of them. Considering that 75 percent of financing in the U.S. is done through our capital markets, which are the deepest and most liquid in the world, why would the Fed continue to pursue this flawed proposal instead of reproposing a rule that would not have such a drastic impact on the U.S. economy? Well, um, in fact, the, the, the capital markets concerns you raised are among the, those that I raised myself in our, in our open uh, board meeting when we put this out for comment. Uh, you I said you wanted say, broad support, and obviously there is dissent among some of your governors, the FDIC, others. So how are we, uh, how are we coming on this, and how are we recognize, rec so we're, uh, you know, we're, we, we've, we're working our way through the comments, and uh, we're coming to the point where it will be appropriate for us to begin to evaluate what changes are appropriate. I've said I think those changes will be broad and material. Uh, and uh, and that's where that is. But we're, we haven't made any decisions yet. We just got the in, comments. In my role as chairman of the Capital Markets Subcommittee, I have seen SEC Chair Gensler push the envelope in terms of rules and regulations that go well beyond the congressional mandate, even encroaching on the jurisdiction of other financial regulators. What is the Fed's response to another agency encroaching <clears throat> on its jurisdiction? We do not comment on other agencies' regulation. However, if they were actually to take your hypothetical at face value, if they were to come into our jurisdiction. Oh, it's more than a hypothetical. And we would react. <laughs> Good. Well, I hope you do. <clears throat> I yield back. So lady from New York, Ms. Velasquez is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Chairman Powell. Um, property insurance rates are becoming prohibitively expensive or inaccessible for homeowners and developers in my community. The FSOC's annual report identifies property insurance rates as an increasing risk, and I recently raised this issue with Secretary Yellen. Is the Fed monitoring the rising cost of insurance and its impact on macroeconomic? Well, if we'll pause the clock, we have staff take a look at the microphone. We need the to clock, clock being frozen is out of respect for Ms. Velasquez, or out of good luck, I'm not Stop. sure. Um, the clock. But we'll, we'll get staff to listen. We'll just suspend for a moment. We need to invest in infrastructure for this committee. Yes. <laughs> well, we're trying to do electronic voting. and. Not no. It's hard enough to just get the microphones to work. Madam Clerk, thank you. Thanks. So all the photographers have left, so the awkward photos for, for uh, Trish will be less awkward. difficulties occurring 
when we have, of course, evidence being given by Chair Powell, semi-annual testimony on the Hill, discussing, of course, the role of the Federal Reserve when it comes to, well, the last question we heard there, all about the encroachment, perhaps, well, some other regulators in and of its turf. But as we know, the market has been reacting to what Fed Chair Powell has been saying. We've seen a bond market rally more broadly. And we've had sort of a lot of questions also surrounding the world of technology. We are indeed a technology show talking about Silicon Valley Bank failure and really the repercussions that came from Rashida Talib, of course, a little bit earlier. But more generally, the market has not seen much movement. More generally, we have seen Bitcoin remaining on the higher side more broadly, as have stocks across the board. Just smaller moves and the bond market continuing to rally overall. Commercial real estate, another key focus of area that has been happening, happening throughout the discussion. And Chair Powell has been saying that he will be continuing to focus indeed on commercial real estate. And Powell's mic, therefore, is not working across the board as we see technical difficulties happening on the Hill at the moment. So, so we'll continue right, to listen we'll in to what's happening with Chair Powell. I think the microphone is now working again. Let's listen in. Ms. Velasquez, you're recognized for five minutes. So, Mr. Chairman, I was asking you about the property insurance rates are becoming prohibitively expensive or inaccessible for homeowners and developers in our community. The ESOC's annual report identifies property insurance rates as an increasing risk. And I recently raised this issue with Secretary Yellen. Is the Fed monitoring the rising cost of insurance and its impact on macroeconomy. So yes, we are very much aware of uh, increases in insurance, including property insurance, and it's it's been adding meaningfully to uh, to inflation. It's not something we have any control or authority over. Same is true of auto insurance. There, just insurance generally has it, prices have gone up a lot. So when we um, talk about the lack of affordability when it comes to housing. Uh, the insurance, the rising cost of insurance is an important factor that is affecting the availability of affordable housing in our communities. And I hope that um, there are some discussions among the feds because it is an increasing risk and it's going to have a direct impact on our economy. Uh, Chairman Powell, I, I know you spoke with uh, Chairman McHenry a little bit on inflation and interest rates. Can you explain what evidence you're looking for before inflation has returned to 2% and interest rates can be cut? Sure. So we, we're not looking for inflation to go all the way down to 2%. That's not what we're looking for. What we want is just more evidence that will give us more confidence that inflation is, is on a path down to 2% sustainably. So that will come in the form of good inflation readings, really. We and want to see you know, just a bit more evidence so that we can be confident. We don't want to have a situation where, um, where it turns out that the six months of good inflation data we had last year, uh, that that didn't turn out to be an accurate signal of where underlying inflation is. So we're just, we're just being careful. And because the economy is so strong and the labor market is so strong, we think we can and should be careful as we approach that decision. And when you say evidence, what evidence? If there's anything... So just, just more, uh, we'd like to see more uh, good, relatively low inflation readings. We're, we're not looking for better inflation readings than we've had. We're just looking for more of them. And, and what will happen is, uh, the, as we go forward, the 12-month inflation will continue to drop because it'll be lower than early last year. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I would like to pick up on where Ms. Talib left off and reiterate the importance of the rulemaking on Section 956. This is an issue that I also raised uh, with Vice Chair Barr, Chairman Grunberg, Acting Comptroller Sue, and, uh, and I told them when they came before this committee that I will be asking for a status update on the rulemaking at every future hearing because it's well past time, 12, 13, 14 years, if you are employed in a company and you are given a task, I will, I will think that you will be fired if you don't get it done 
and it has taken 12 long years. So you are the chairman of the Fed. How is the Fed working with other agencies to propose the rule? So there's a lot going on in regulation at the Fed right now. My understanding on 956 is that there have been discussions between the regulatory agencies, and I think it's not three, I think it's more like six agencies that have to agree. I know. I have not seen a proposal. I think something is under, under consideration, but it's not something that's gotten to me yet. I will ask the, the next time, and believe me, I'll be here. Great. Thank you. Gentlemen, yields back. Gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, good to see you. Um, you have said numerous times that the capital framework is about right and that banks are well capitalized. Do you still believe this? I do. Uh, and um, given that you believe that, and given the fact that the Basel III endgame proposal dramatically increases capital requirements on banks, would a, would a, would a reproposal that implemented Basel III in a capital neutral way, uh, would it, could it do so without jeopardizing financial stability? Could, I mean, hypothetically, yeah. Okay, according to Latham and Watkins, 97% of the comment letters either opposed, called for a reproposal, or expressed substantial concerns uh, uh, about the Basel III endgame proposal. And those negative comments came from across the ideological spectrum and from various interests. Without objection, I would ask the chair to uh, include uh, that report into, into the record. With that, without objection, I'd ask the chair to include that report. In without the objection. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Chairman, did you see that report? I did. Uh, does that concern you, that 97% of the comments uh, uh, were, were negative? So we didn't do our own counts, so I can't, I mean, I can't make an assessment, but I, I, it's, I would say it's unlike anything I've seen. Uh, Basel III, the Basel III comment period ended on the same day as the Fed's data collection on the proposal, which is an odd process since the data should have been collected far earlier, analyzed, and the results should have been available for the public to comment on before the comment period ended. Why did the Federal Reserve choose to do a quantitative impact study during the comment period uh, for the proposal, foreclosing any ability by the public to comment on the results of the study? Well, I mean, we are, the movie's not over. We are where we are. And uh, Vice Chair Barr did commit to putting the QIS out for comment. We will receive those comments, and they'll be, they'll, they'll, those comments will be taken into consideration as we, as we think about the path ahead. Well, speaking of process, you've got your excellent general counsel right behind you there. Um, and I don't want to get into privilege here, but um, have the lawyers at the Fed raised any process concerns or Administrative Procedure Act issues uh, with the board? Let me just say that we're, you know, we're committed to doing uh, transparent and uh, um, reasonable and data-based rulemaking in compliance with the Administrative Procedure Act. Well, of course, giving the public the ability to comment on the quantitative data that has been provided obviously is consistent with good process. Um, uh, sir, uh, Governors Bowman and Waller, Vice Chair Hill and Director McKernan all dissented on the proposal, and Vice Chair Jefferson expressed concerns with it during his statement. Uh, under your tenure as chair, can you identify any other regulatory proposal which has elicited this much dissent? No. Uh, have you have you in the past acknowledged uh, in front of this committee that you will not move forward with proposals without consensus? Or you have acknowledged that in the past, that, and we appreciate uh, that commitment to consensus. Um, have you uh, ha have you um, achieved consensus yet uh, on the Bo on the Basel proposal? I, let me say I, I am confident that we will. But that's a process that we're, as I mentioned, you know, we're evaluating the comments. We're just coming to the place where we're going to start talking about the path ahead. And I, I am confident that we'll, we'll achieve a very broad support on the board. Mr. Chairman, um, do you agree that the heterogeneity and business model diversity within the banking sector uh, contributes to system-wide financial stability? I strongly do. Uh, and do you agree that a concentrated business model in the banking sector would present a potentially systemic risk? 
Potentially, yeah. And, and this is this is one of my major concerns with the proposal, uh, Mr. Chairman, because by de facto repealing regulatory tailoring, subjecting Category 3 and 4 regional banks to one-size-fits-all standards that currently only apply to large GSIBs, discouraging securitization, which is the private sector solution for dispersing risk, eliminating the use of internal model risk models and transitioning the, transitioning the industry and regulators toward only a standardized framework, actually actually would would push the uh, the industry into a smaller and more concentrated looking industry and as a result would would in my view actually increase systemic risk and decrease market competition do you share that concern I, I think it's a real concern I um, and, and again I think that's part of what goes into my thinking certainly about about the, the proposal and where it needs to go well, given all of these concerns, uh, we hope that you can commit to reproposing the Basel III endgame, uh, and uh, we, we strongly urge you to take that into consideration. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I Gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, is recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Good to see you again. I want to go a little deeper into the commercial real estate issue and the potential impact on regional banks. Uh, this morning, uh, Scott Rector, who's a a member of the New York Fed Board of Directors released a white paper on CNBC this morning uh, describing the trillions of dollars in commercial real estate loans that will come due over the next couple of years. He described it as a, quote, slow-moving train wreck, close quote, and uh, for, for our regional banks. Uh, he went on to predict that it will force between a little over 500 banks, thereabouts, to either fail or consolidate um, he also described what he, he termed as a doom loop where, you know, similar to Silicon Valley Bank, when people lose confidence, when depositors lose confidence in, in the bank, they, they pull their money out and we end up in a bad situation. Uh, now, <clears throat> you know, I don't believe everything that, that, that I, I read or hear, but in Congress we do tend to repeat it. And uh, I just wanted to get a sense from you. I am seeing in my own city of Boston, we've got 20% vacancy rates in, in office space. We rely on that for a lot of the tax revenues for the city. Uh, but I'm just wondering your thoughts on that issue. Is there a systemic concern here? Uh, or is this isolated? And uh, you know, might, might lowering the interest rates help some of those banks? Because I hear from my developers in, in our area that no one's lending. So, yeah, crack at it? Sure. So I, I haven't seen that report, so I can't comment on it, but, but I can comment on, on uh, commercial real estate. So we've had a secular change in the economy, which has left office, you know, office uh, rentals in many places, office buildings. The demand for them is just is significantly lower, at least temporarily and perhaps for a long time. And also the same is true for downtown, in some places, downtown retail that's associated with office workers. So. It's a shock to the system, and yeah. we know, we've known this for some time, and we've gone through the commercial banks in the United States, and, and so have the other regulators. We've done it jointly, and identified the ones that have high concentration and are going to need to deal with that. And so we've been, we've been in contact with those banks and you know, uh, talking to them about how they're going to deal with this, how are they going to absorb these losses, do they have enough capital, do they have the liquidity, do they have a plan? to do this, and are, is it consistent with their lending practices and that kind of thing. So it's going to be something we work through over a period of years. Uh, and um, I, I do think it's it's slow moving. I think that part of it is right. Uh, it, it, you ask about 500 banks, I have no idea about that number. I, you know, But certainly there would be some banks, probably smaller ones, uh, that have these high concentrations. It, it's not the very large banks. It's really a manageable thing at the large banks. So uh, I think that's what it's going to be. And it's, it's a serious problem and, and, um, and more serious in some locations and jurisdictions and with some banks than others. But it's one we'll, we'll be working through. And yeah. I, I think that's how I would think about it. Does, does uh, you know, the Silicon Valley Bank situation signature, you know, the money moves so quickly in those, in those cases. It was instantaneous now. The, 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 the velocity of, of, of money moving out of those banks really, I think, in some ways contributed to, to their failures. Um, are, we, are we looking at any, anything technologically that, that might be able to 
address some of that or mitigate it? Sure. So we, you know, we, we also, after Silicon Valley Bank, we, we be, got in contact with and worked with financial institutions that had high concentrations of uninsured deposits. Yeah. And so, and many of them have ever greatly improved their, their liquidity position. So that's the thing that we're working on. Okay. As you probably know, we're also working on some, uh, some uh, liquidity rules which will strengthen our, our, our framework of liquidity rules. But that's, yeah. that's something we haven't proposed yet. Let me ask you something off topic. Um, so we know that Russia has about $300 billion in U.S. We, we've frozen assets. Uh, Russian assets of about $300 billion between U.S. and, and European banks. Um, you want to comment on that? What, what I'd like to see is us give that to Ukraine, to be honest with you. I know that's a very simplistic idea, but I'm just wondering if there's any historic example that we could look to if Congress has to take the necessary steps to, to direct that, redirect that money to Ukraine so they can feed their people and fight that war. This whole area of sanctions and foreign assets and things like that is really uh, controlled and directed by the administration, by the elected branch of government. We are, all we are is just a technical uh, seat around, you know, in, in the back row uh, to help. We, we don't make those decisions, and I, I wouldn't comment. I know you're on, big on history. I was just wondering if there was any examples out there that we might, yeah. might provide guidance to us. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you for being here. Uh, when I'm back in my district in Texas, I'm constantly hearing concerns surrounding the fundamentally flawed Basel III. We've talked at length about that today, end game proposal. These concerns are not only coming from my banking industry, but also from farmers, ranchers, uh, small business owners who are concerned about how this proposal will impact the ability to access capital in the future. And, it, and, uh, and, and to all of us, did it not raise alarms? And not, we've heard about the 97% today of public comments on this proposal when they all came out negative. And, Americans across all sectors are worried about the disastrous implications that will follow this proposal and have tried to make that known to banking regulators who continue to ignore them. It's time for federal regulators to take these concerns seriously and, quite frankly, just, I believe, start over. So I urge you and your colleagues to rethink the misguided policy and do what is best for American people, small business, Main Street America, and withdraw the Basel III proposal. Now, Chairman Powell, uh, given the <coughs> concerns raised by financial institutions, again, farmers, ranchers, et cetera, and other communities across the country, uh, can you uh, elaborate on how the Federal Reserve is responding to and addressing these comments that are mostly negative and request modification, delay, or complete withdrawal of the proposal of Basel? Yes, I will. So we're, we're in the process of reviewing the comments. They were quite voluminous. They were very detailed, a lot of data, a lot of analysis, and that's just what we wanted. So we got those, and now we're, it, it's a lot. It's hundreds of them, and we're going through them, and we're just at the point where we're about to begin then turning to the question of what changes should we make to the proposal. We, we haven't made any decisions. We haven't really gotten to that stage yet, but we're getting it. Remember, we only got the comments yeah. less than two months ago, so that's, it's just we're, we're at that stage. So we're, we're looking at it. My, as I mentioned, my own view is that there will be material and broad changes to the proposal as we go forward. And we haven't really made decisions yet, though. It's, it's just a little bit early for that. We're glad you're looking at it. Uh, I want to bring up the long-term debt proposal rule, which would require banks to issue enough long-term debt to cover capital losses. Now, Congress uh, worked uh, to pass legislation requiring the tailoring of regulations to the size of a financial institution. This is meant to protect banks of all sizes and allow the fam for families and businesses in my district to uh, have options to meet their lending needs. So the Fed's long-term debt proposal would undo any sort of regulatory tailoring and puts in a place a new long-term debt uh, issuance requirements on regional banks, which require these banks to issue long-term debt, both at the parent holding company level and the IDI level. Now, these regional banks will uh, face increased costs when they are already facing towering regulatory burdens from this administration, and those are the banks that people do business with. So, Mr. Chairman, do you believe that this proposal rule goes against the requirements of S-2155, the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act, and will you commit to exploring this issue further with your colleagues? So, we're, we're committed to implementing 2155. We believe that, that, you know, you, that the, you know, regulatory and supervision, of, regulation and supervision of banks needs to reflect their size and and, uh, and activities, and that, that's, that's something we'll be considering as we, as we go forward with this. Okay. Short time i got left. Americans continue to feel the pain from one away inflation created by the Biden administration as everyday costs continue to stay expensive. As you know, I'm in the car business, 
and where inflation is just running rampant in my industry. And the irresponsible and partisan American Rescue Plan forced through Congress by Democrats only made uh, in more inflation more of a problem. And now American families and businesses have been forced to deal with runaway inflation for three full years now, uh, which has caused some major hardships. So quickly, the ARPA injected nearly uh, $2 trillion of deficit spending to our already struggling economy. And how does this type of inflated spending, combined with economic headwinds like supply chain uh, shortages, impact the economy? And doesn't this kind of reckless spending have fuel, actually fuel the pressures of inflation? I, th I think there are a lot of causes of the inflation we've seen. Um, you know, we saw this inflation everywhere in the world. So the reopening, uh, really the reopening of the economy after uh, w with very strong demand and constrained supply, you saw inflation in all, all the advanced economies. Um, it was a little sharper here at the beginning. I think there's a role for monetary policy in that. There's a role for fiscal policy. There's a role for the pandemic, a starring role for the pandemic. You know, our job is to, is to deal with it, and that's what we've been doing. Well, thank you for always keeping small business in Main Street America in your, uh, in your calculations. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for recognizing in your opening statement the importance of immigrants in keeping or costs uh, down. And I want to thank you and the administration for what has been an excellent 2023 economic report. We've got 3.1 percent economic growth, by far the best in the developed world. Headline inflation, 2.4 percent. And that's not a little blip, you know, a one-month number. That's for the whole of 2023 and compares very favorably for the, with the uh, pre-pandemic portion of the Trump administration when we had inflation of 3.5 percent. Um, my goal here is to convince you to cut more and sooner because uh, for, for a number of reasons. The first is that I know, you know, if you ask a constituent, they want zero inflation and zero unemployment. You know that we can't have that and have concluded that the economy works best with a 2 percent inflation rate target. But I've looked at the history of that 2 percent number. It seems to come from Auckland from the 1980s. Uh, and there's a lot of arguments that your target should be just a little bit higher. Uh, Larry Summers uh, recently produced a study arguing that the cost of money is part of the cost of living. So we have this weird paradox where you're trying to keep the cost of groceries down by raising interest rates, but as the ranking member points out, the big issue is housing. And your measure of inflation seems to treat all Americans as renters, even though two-thirds are homeowners. Um, and so when interest rates go up, that's an increase in the cost of living for anyone with an adjustable rate mortgage, anybody looking to buy a house, anybody with a home equity loan. Um, obviously, we would cut interest rates a little sooner and a little more if your target was something closer to 2.3 percent. So I'll ask you, is there substantial economic analysis uh, uh, that argues that your target rate and the economy would work better if we had uh, a slightly higher uh, target than 2 percent? Um, not really, no. What's happened is, um, you pointed out in New Zealand, but what's happened is that uh, 2% has become the global standard, and it's I, a pretty durable standard. I, I, I don't I, have I, any reason to think that, that, that it's a problem for the United States to get to 2% inflation. You know, we're at 2.4% right now, I, headline inflation. I, 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 I would last ask leave to add to the transcript of this hearing numerous articles that argue for something between 2.3 uh, and, and even 3%. I'm not arguing for as high as 3%. Let's look at Basel. <laughs> Uh, there's nothing free here. If the uh, standards are too high, we lose economic growth. If they're too low, we have um, uh, uh, bailouts and uh, bankruptcies. Uh, but I think everybody agrees that the standard should be well-crafted. You've got a system where everybody drafting this is well-dressed and focused on Wall Street. And you've got Basel rules that discriminate against Main Street and for Wall Street. I'll give you some examples. 
uh, 65 basis, uh, it's 65 percent if you're a publicly traded company and make a loan to a publicly traded company. You make a loan to CalPERS, they're not publicly traded, without objection, I'd like to put in their article under the record. Uh, and so they're, in effect, getting, gonna have a tough, tougher time getting a loan. The local pizzeria is gonna have a tougher time getting a, a loan. You've got, in Basel III, ignoring mortgage insurance, which obviously makes the loan uh, more prudentially sound for the bank and uh, is very necessary for first-time home buyers. And you've got uh, a system where if you make investments in long-term bonds on Wall Street and you put them in the hold to maturity category, you don't have to recognize the losses uh, and mark to market. Um, so there, I, I hope you'll look at these in terms of the competition between Wayne Street and Wall Street for bank loans. Finally, we go to clean energy investment. Can I count on you to personally look at the paradox where Basel III the, uh, uh, treats clean energy tax credits much more harshly than uh, low-income housing tax credits for no ascertainable reason. Can yes. You, thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk, is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Prowl, thank you for being here today. Um, I'm concerned with the, the small dollar <clears throat> credit for businesses. As a, as a former business owner for over 20 years, I can attest that as the small dollar business credit becomes more expensive and less convenient, businesses are going to turn to credit cards and other alternative financing for business purchases. These inevitably result in even higher costs, which goes down to the consumer, which means that they're going to pay more for the services or the products. But in February of this year, total credit card debt reached a record of $1.7 trillion. According to Intuit's Small Business Annual in Index Annual Report, average monthly credit card balances were 27% higher in 2023 than they were in 2019. What do you view as the driving force behind these record high levels of credit card debt? Part of it would be growth in the economy, so that'll be part of it, just that it's a bigger economy and, and a bigger number. I don't, I don't, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what that is. You know, as you know, people had lots of extra cash uh, during the pandemic from forced savings. They've spent that down, now they're borrowing. Um, I'm not sure. So, uh, if there was a rule to force banks to tighten lending, do you think the rule would drive businesses and consumers to alternative forms of credit? I do. I think, you know, I, I, if you raise, yes, if you raise lending costs for banks, then at the margin, that will make uh, non-bank lenders, right. you know, they'll get some of that business. And if it becomes more com uh, complex or less convenient, then businesses will turn to these alternative forms like credit card. I can tell you that from and experience. Have, yeah. Yes. Um, well, I've called for the withdrawal of the Basel III endgame proposal entirely. Uh, will you commit to an analysis of how bank capital proposals like Basel affect small business credit access and the small dollar lending before finalizing such proposals? I, well, I commit to that. I, I, l let me look into that. I don't, uh, I don't want to make a commitment that I'll undertake some big study, but uh, we'll, we'll look at the issue. But do you feel it's important that we do have an understanding of the effect it's going to have on folks? Small, small business is the backbone. It's the, the, and, <laughs> the and bloodline of our and they economy. they create the jobs. That's yes. right. I, I do agree. Yeah. Okay. The chairman asked you for your thoughts on withdrawing or reproposing the Basel III endgame proposal. Have you specifically discussed withdrawing the proposal with Vice Chairman Michael Barr or the other governors? So I, I don't want to get into our internal uh, uh, you know, doings, um, but I will say that I understand it is a, uh, a live option. It, again, we're not at a stage of being able to even have that discussion yet because we're not really, we don't have a, we, have a, we don't have a, you know, we've got to decide first what changes do we think are appropriate, and that'll take a little time, and then the question will be reproposal. I, what I said is, when we get to that point, if, a, if reproposal is the right thing to do, we're not going to hesitate at all. It's, it's, it's a perfectly live option. All right. Um, I, I, in the current environment we have in politics in this country, there's not a lot that you find bipartisan agreement on, but I think you could find some agreement in, in uh, withdrawing that proposal. 
Um, can you explain the importance of broad consensus at the Fed on proposals like B3E? Are you concerned with recent trends of disagreement among board members related to major proposals? So I, I think we're going to get to broad consensus at the Fed. I do. It's, I think it's very important. You know, this is this is um, uh, been our culture that we you know we try to find common ground, and uh, we've we've been able to do that in, reg in the regulatory space, and I, I expect we will be here as well. And so I'm committed to that. Could it be that th we're we're seeing this level of disagreement because uh, of extreme measures that are being taken now that may not have been taken in the past? I mean, a total difference of of uh, opinion and understanding and philosophy regarding free market economy. I, I, I wouldn't, I won't, uh, I won't speculate, but I will point out that, that you know, uh, four of the seven governors uh, during the open board meeting at which we put it out for comment expressed real concerns, very specific concerns about the proposal and, and, and said we would look at the comments when they came in and that's what we're doing. All right. Do you feel that they have uh, validity in their concerns? I was one of the four, so yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> with with the, the few moments I have, seconds I have remaining, there's a recent uh, report of FinCEN working with financial institutions to query uh, legal purchases made by uh, uh, American citizens. Has the Federal Reserve been instructed within the past three years by Treasury or anyone else to search Americans' legal transactions? Not, not that I know of, no. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster is recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here. Um, you know, as, as Ben remarked, there's a near-term emergency to get the $60 billion in military assistance to Ukraine. And separate from that, there remains a longer-term need for reconstruction assistance to Ukraine, uh, which the World Bank estimates is somewhere north of $400 billion. Now, at the start of the Russian invasion, the free democracies of the world uh, froze um, roughly $300 billion in Russian currency assets, primarily at European banks and, and financial institutions. And the Biden administration and many of our allies have recently taken the stance that those assets should be leveraged somehow to provide re reconstruction resources to Ukraine. I, I support this concept, and I believe that additional action should be taken uh, to ensure that we hold Russia accountable. But there are real concerns on the impact that this might have on central banking system, on the primacy of the dollar, the euro, um, and, and so on. And so my question is, have you seen just the act of, of freezing these assets and not seizing them, but simply freezing them, have you seen deleterious effects on, on the the primacy of the dollar, the confidence in the central banking system. Is there any visible downside from the act of freezing that's visible so far in the two years since we've done it? I, I can't point to any. Um, I, I can't point to any. Okay, so that's a, that's an interesting observation when we think of taking the additional step of, of actually seizing them, that at least so far, because, you know, to my mind, having them frozen is as violent as, um, and, and as violent as, as seizing them outright. And so that's interesting that so far we haven't seen that. Um, now, in, in terms of the, the Basel III and, and, and so on, um, there is a, um, uh, there's a frustration I've had over the fact that directionally the effects of these are clear, but the magnitude of effects are not. You know, for example, if you talk about the, the effect on uh, the prices seen by derivative end users of increased capital requirement, you know, directionally it's clear. If you raise capital requirements, banks will withdraw from these markets to some extent. Other players will step in partly and take up part of the slack, and the spreads will increase and so on. Um, well, is the data that you've collected collected enough uh, for you to actually estimate the magnitude of these effects instead of simply the direction? I, I think it's really hard to get down to the micro level and, and try to assess that because you're right, there would be multiple effects. But you, you do know the, you, you know the direction, you know what si the sign that, is. That's right, but you, yeah. know, the, you know, if you can avoid financial crises with a microscopic uh, increase in prices seen by end users, that's one thing. If it's a very large uh, difference in the price. So the, the magnitude matters a lot when you're doing these balancing things. And, and a lot of it depends on, actually, you need a model for how the different market players will react. 
And is that really not going to be in the scope of the analysis that you anticipate from the so I, quantitative? I, I do, I believe we have done some work on that, and I think the banks and other participants have done work on that as well, and come up with a range of answers. But it, it you know, this is a, I mean, there are just an awful lot of variables in these equations, so it's hard to say with any confidence. It's, I mean, that's why it's, 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 uh, it's hard to, the job of deciding the precise level of appropriate capital is, uh, is a hard one. Yeah. Um, and now with, uh, you know, with 10 years, we've had two major crises uh, with both a fiscal uh, and a monetary response. Um, are there the lessons that you can learn now that, you know, I believe, and it seems like your testimony indicates that we're kind of approaching back to normal now? And we've seen um, in the crisis of 15 years ago, uh, we saw what many people thought was an inadequate fiscal response, that the fiscal response was, you know, less than half of the output gap. Um, and we limited by political um, you know, political will to do things. And then, of course, you were limited by the zero bound in, in what you could do for most of a decade, and we had a long recovery. Um, and the comparison, you know, to the recent, the COVID recovery has been very sharp, and it's quite remarkably put us right back on that track. Are there any lessons that you've sort of drawn about the the importance of the, the getting the right balance of fiscal and monetary response to these, these shocks? Um, so we think about that. A lot, uh, and, and I, I think it's. It, I have to say, I have to start by saying it's too soon to really tell because the answers you would give today, the picture looks very different than what it looked like a year ago. And so, uh, and a year from now, we'll be looking back, going and saying, we've learned so much more. So I think we, the, the pandemic is still writing the story of our economy right now, and we should just be prepared to be surprised with the next chapter, as we were with with 2023, the very strong growth the sharp decline in, in inflation while the labor market remained very strong. General very few forecasters had that, but we can talk about it. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'll now go to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Chairman Powell, thank you for being here today and for your testimony. I'd like to start off, first of all, by completely echoing everything uh, Congressman Barr said. A lot of us have talked about Basel III endgame, and I think uh, Congressman Barr kind of nailed uh, the thought process. I do hope you'll kind of withdraw that and take the comments you've heard from here and from so many others about the, the, the hazards with the current approach. But I'd also like to, um, you know, address one of the other practices by the Federal Reserve, and it, it's the practice of paying interest on excess reserve balances held, at the, held with the Fed accounts. It's my strong belief that rewarding banks with returns for taking no market risks actually harms our economy and it discourages financial institutions from lending money into the economy. Instead, they park it at the Fed. Now, this has uh, little to no impact on very large corporations, but it can have a crippling impact on small and mid-market firms. And we especially saw this uh, in, the, in the long recovery uh, as Dodd-Frank was implemented uh, in the Obama years, uh, transition to the Trump years. We changed some of that mindset with a lot of other policies uh, but we saw a, a, a strong surging economy. So our, our country would pay a price for this market distortion by the Fed in two ways. First, they're unable to obtain loans at competitive rates uh, because the money's sucked out of the market. Uh, frankly, a lot of them don't even have access to lending except through bank capital. So it forces them into other forms of capital, equity capital and others. Uh, second, uh, th they ultimately pay higher rates whenever they have these alternative uh, means of capital. And uh, so today I've introduced a prohibition on the uh, IOER Act, which would prohibit the Federal Reserve from paying interest on excess reserves. By eliminating IOER, we can begin to return our economy to the undistorted free market economy it's supposed to have. You know, the alternative is you could simply raise requirements. We see some of those moral hazards when you do it across the board uh, to, uh, with approach like Basel. So what's your case for why you should keep paying interest on excess reserves? Well, we, as you know, we don't see the, uh, the downsides that you're talking about. You know, banks, 
banks have a cost of funds and they have what they can earn, and that's what really matters is the spread. And if they wanted to do it, they could simply buy treasuries on their own, uh, and, and they could do that independently. Um, I suppose they can independently keep it at the Fed, but they don't have to buy, they don't even have to put it on their own balance sheets in the same way. They've got immediate liquidity with Fed over it. Over, overnight account. So I don't, I don't see how that's different than what they could already do. I, I, what I was going to say was, you know, banks, banks can earn a much bigger spread by lending to corporates. So their, their incentive to lend is the same as it always was. This doesn't affect that. You know, really, it's their, their they have a cost of funds and they have the ability to earn, to, ha to have reserves. But you know, that that's not going to. They're not earning a profit on that. So, or, or a big one, they can run a much bigger profit by lending to small corporations. Well, speaking of profit, I mean, the Federal Reserve isn't officially supposed to be a for-profit corporation, but you are supposed to pay uh, for your operating costs off of positive cash flow. And right now, the Fed doesn't have positive cash flow. In fact, the Fed has negative cash flow. Um, so it's not entirely unrelated that uh, the Federal Reserve operated a $114.3 billion loss in 2023 and currently is carrying a $133 billion loss on its balance sheet this year. So it, it, it's, you know, not the right approach, I think, to be paying essentially that much out in excess reserves to, to banks that uh, are holding capital uh, in the Fed when they could be deploying it into the market. So right now the interest you're paying banks in money market funds exceeds the income you're getting. Uh, on the $7.6 trillion balance sheet assets that you have to the tune of $133 billion uh, asset. So, you know, effectively the Fed is operating at, a, at an operating loss. So what's the path back to cash flow positivity for the Fed? As, as you know, we've, you know, for many years uh, during the QE large balance sheet period, we've contributed way over a trillion dollars in net earnings. To the bank, which is to to the Treasury Department, so you can't you can't look at the loss without mentioning that we've been you know giving effectively a hundred billion dollars a year in profits every year to the Treasury Department. So the other side of that is when we raise rates to do the job you've assigned us to get inflation under control. Uh, when we do that, we 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 absorb paper losses. It has no effect on our operating uh, the way we operate uh, the Fed. And, and you know, if we, if we retained all the earnings we have, then it wouldn't be a problem. But we don't do that. We give that money to Treasury. Thank you. Um, and I think the last thing is I just uh, encourage you to, to halt any effort to uh, develop a central bank digital currency. It doesn't need designed, developed, and it certainly doesn't need established. I yield. The gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Beatty. Mrs. Beatty is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our ranking member, and, and thank you, uh, Director Powell, for uh, being here. Uh, let me start by saying thank you for the monetary report. I've had a chance to try to peruse it, and, and there are headings in there that says the labor market remains strong. You'd probably agree to that, your report. I would. Let that say that's a yes. Uh, also, it talks about unemployment rates uh, being low by historical standards. You'd agree with that? Uh, it also states that the global pandemic played a huge role with the inflation uh, rate, and inflation rates are on the decline, as reported in several charts in here, and also substantiated by the Federal Reserve of New York and Michigan surveys that I've uh, read. Uh, it also talks about job gains and uses the word robust, robust uh, jobs. So uh, I want to thank you for educating us on that. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like uh, the record to show that all of this also resulted during the Biden-Harris administration of making sure so often we hear in this committee and other committees uh, about what the administration is, is not doing and uh, what our economy and jobs uh, look like. Uh, now let me move on to something that's very dear to me and want to thank our ranking member for bringing it up, and that's the lack of affordable housing, which is one of the primary things that I hear about when I'm back home. I'm on more panels uh, to try to explain what you do, what we do, or oftentimes what we don't do and why we have this. 
Um, while I know that interest uh, rate hikes have successfully brought down the inflation, rising rates have also had an adverse effect on the cost and the pace of, of housing construction and costs. Are you concerned uh, about the effects that interest rate hikes are having on the cost of financing uh, new construction? And the second part, how do you expect to control for long-term housing inflation that might uh, have a potential rate cuts, how it might affect that? So um, our our policy to bring inflation down is to is to raise interest rates, and that works through several channels. One of them is probably the most important is interest sensitive spending, and within that you have housing and durable goods and things like that. So, you know, during the um, during the early days of the pandemic, the housing industry was about to all go bankrupt, and all of the all of the facilities that we did really supported that industry through their critical time. When we're going in the other direction, when we're raising rates, housing is definitely affected. We understand that. It's not something we, we want to have happen, just it is the reality that housing will slow a lot when you raise interest rates. We've done that, and we're doing it for the longer run benefit of the people we serve to, to restore price stability, which is beyond value for people to have price stability. We get it that in the near term, uh, that's higher rates, that's fewer sales, people are locked into low rate mortgages, we get all that. but. We got to do this because it'll benefit the country and people in the longer run. And, and I have a great appreciation um, for that. But uh, also, when I go back home to the uh, district, uh, what I hear a lot from agencies and individuals who work with advocacy groups that the effects of interest rate hikes are not borne equally to all American households. So we hear that, and there's no doubt that low-income and minority communities are hit the highest or, or the hardest by these monetary policy changes. Black households and business owners have historically faced challenges with home ownership and access to capital, and they're disproportionately impacted by the rate hikes. Uh, does the Fed, do you have anything uh, that you can help me with with this dilemma and how we can better achieve economic goals in a more precise and equitable manner. So I, you know, I think it's working. You see inflation coming down, and um, and that's why I do think it's likely uh, at some time this year, if the economy, you know, proceeds along the path we expect, that we will begin to uh, reduce rates. Um, so that's that's really the path that we're on, and. Um, uh, I do hope it works out that way. Uh, and and when meantime, you say, I don't have a lot of time, but when you say economy, what does that mean? Helping poor people and black people get more jobs, more money? Um, so our, our forecast is for continued strong growth, a continued strong labor market uh, with you know wages going up and, uh, and also with inflation coming down. So that kind of an economy. Okay. My time is up. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman McHenry and Ranking Member Waters for holding this hearing, and, and thank you, Chair Powell, for being with us today. I'd like to start by discussing the Independent Automated Teller Machine Owners or Operators section of the Bank Secrecy Act Examination Manual. I want to ensure that financial institutions will not be discouraged from, from providing banking services to the independently owned ATM industry. In 2021, you made it clear that the industry does not automatically present a higher risk for illicit finance. I'd like to know what efforts have been made by the Federal Reserve to fully communicate that position to financial institutions across the country. I will have to get back to you on that one. All right. Thank you. Well, it, and so I might just add, uh, listening to independent ATM operators over the time that I've served in Congress, I've come to understand that, unfortunately, and it was in the bank examiner's manual up until just about a, a, a couple years ago, um, these, uh, in, these operators were identified as being extraordinarily risky, and that was causing them to be debanked in many cases. So I do hope that you'll take a look at that and make sure that we're communicating that to financial institutions and, most importantly, to the regulators. Chair Powell, Tennessee is home to over 1,000 foreign-based businesses that have chosen to invest in our state and create more than 160,000 jobs. These jobs are reliant upon cross-border financing provided by global banks, including foreign banking organizations. 
The Federal Reserve has long maintained the principles of national treatment and equality of competitive opportunity when regulating foreign banks and assessing them uh, based on their U.S. operations. Are you still committed to these principles? Yes. And how will these principles be reflected as you move to finalize the Basel in-game proposal? So we have received a whole separate set of, of, of comments from the foreign banks, and we'll look at those um, you know, very much in that spirit and, uh, and make appropriate changes. Thank you. Chair Powell, the Basel III in-game will incentivize firms to transfer credit risks off their balance sheets. One avenue for such a transfer is synthetic securitization, the framework of which must be approved by the Federal Reserve. However, it is my understanding that there is a substantial backlog of reviews and approvals of these securitization frameworks. It is concerning that the Federal Reserve is directed to, uh, is, is directing the risk transfer, yet also impeding it, in my view. Can you comment uh, or can you commit to reviewing this approval process and taking steps to reduce the backlog of pending securitization applications? So, as I understand it, these, these transactions are becoming popular right now. There's a lot of appetite to do them. And um, we're not we're not stopping them. We're just being careful because you know there was there were similar things that happened uh, about credit risk transfer during the global financial crisis that didn't actually work out. So we want to make sure that these structures really do actually durably transfer, and, and we think that they do. But we just need to be careful because we you know the last experience with these was. Uh, uh, you know, was was difficult back in the crisis, in the last crisis. So it's just something that uh, we're not intending to slow these down, and, and uh, I think we'll try to get through it. Is it is a is it a lack of available resources to apply to the approval process, or is it an intentional slow walking to make sure that uh, every I is dotted, every T crossed? I, I don't actually know, but I I, I do what I, what I heard was what I have been told is. We're not stopping these, but we're going to be careful with them and make and just just be absolutely careful that they really do transfer credit risk in a durable kind of sustained way, and that's that's the thing. And I, I don't think it's an intention to go slow or to have a backlog. It's just uh, and, and so I, I don't know what the staffing issue is. Uh, you know, we'll we'll check. All right, thank you. As the Federal Reserve continues to consider proposals designed and debated in Europe, such as Basel III, has the Federal Reserve Supervisory Climate Committee or the Financial Stability Committee had any discussions regarding the adoption of ESG risks in capital requirements? I don't know. Has there been any discussion in other committees regarding the adoption of ESG risks in capital requirements? Any discussion, I, I really don't know. It, let me say that's not something we're considering, but it, you know, when you ask me any discussion, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's not a priority oh, in to capital put it, to put it mildly, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I see my time is running out. I appreciate your, uh, your answers and any further light you can shed on those matters, I'd appreciate. I yield Thank back, you. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Cast, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being here today. Um, I, I want to start, Dan, just with following up on the exchange you had with Mr. Sherman. Um, as I think you know, I led a letter with 106 of my colleagues with concerns about specifically the clean energy tax equity provisions in Basel. I appreciate your commitment to look at that. I, I wonder if I could just put a little bit of a sharper point on it. Can you look at that before the rule is finalized and potentially issue some sort of an addendum to the rule? The concern I have is the number of banks who are, who are a little bit frozen right now waiting for some clarity on that, and I'd prefer we not slow down the rate of clean energy investing in our country if we don't have to. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think um, there's a proposal, and, uh, you know, we're, we're well aware of the commentary, and we're going to... Uh, react appropriately. I, I don't okay. know that we can sink, pull one thing out of line and deal with it. Uh, but I, I also, I, it's, this is, you know, we're, we're making good progress, and I think we'll be okay. back uh, okay, reasonably well, soon with some answers. Okay, well, time is of the essence. I appreciate anything you can do. Um, second thing, good thing about going late here, you get to follow up. I want to follow up on your discussion with Congresswoman Garcia here. Um, I really appreciated your, your comments in the 60 Minutes interview last month when you mentioned that immigration is a big part of the story of the labor market coming back into balance. Um, now, now, generally, and correct me if I'm wrong, more immigration is generally going to ease inflationary pressure. Is that all else equal? Is that a safe characterization? You know, it, it's probably closer to neutral, actually, because you, you know, people come in, uh, they also spend, you know, so it's, it's not clear that, that 
immigrants coming in. They add to GDP. Okay, so also, either we're going to get economic growth and or right, downward so pressure on wages. More workers, to, so yeah. that might, wages might, might go up a little bit less, but at the same time, they're also spending. So I, we had this conversation. It depends on what you assume, but I think it's better to just assume it's sort of broadly neutral from an inflation okay. standpoint. So, so I guess, and maybe you've answered the second question, but given as, as you all are using the Census Bureau data that is more conservative than the CBO data, and obviously we're all making estimates in the future, can you speak at all to whether your forward views on economic growth and inflation, how, how sensitive are they to your assumptions about that census versus CBO data on what the actual level of immigration is to the country right now? I, I think the CBO assumptions are, would, would, um, are, are meaningfully higher and would, would affect growth and would, you know, would be part of the explanation why growth was strong last year. And, and would be a reason to expect, I mean, it's not the main reason, but it would, be, it would definitely add to growth this year. And I wouldn't say that we accept one version of the other. We're, you know, we're studying, we, we study the CBO numbers carefully. We're just trying to get to the right answer. And, uh, but it, I mean, I think the CB, CBO shows, and they say so, stronger growth, higher growth, more people. I, I don't know the per capita growth goes up, but the absolute level of growth goes up. Okay. Um, last question, I'm, I, I, I think there's a lot of good news in the monetary report that you all just issued around wage growth. We've seen um, you know, the, the lower quartile of earners starting to close some of those historic gaps. We've seen minority groups and women start to close some of those gaps. What I, what I didn't see, and I don't know if, you, if this is because you, you all haven't done it or I just didn't read closely enough, have you seen any gaps in, regionally within the U.S.? Are there parts of the country that are seeing stronger wage growth than others? There are. I, I don't have that off the top of my head. I um, want to go back and if I can just, I, when I talked about immigration, I think that the immigration story for last year was part of the positive supply shock and was part of the reason why, why inflation came down. I was really asking the question over the longer run. Fair enough. And there I think it's more of a more Fair enough. being neutral. I, I want to appreciate that. I, I want to just, just close on this regional piece because the, the Atlanta Fed, which is the best I could find that looks to do at least some of my census regions, that as I look through, there's a, you know, and you look at which regions are consistently running above. I think that New England and the and the West are consistently showing wage increase above average, and the the West, South, Central, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana are consistently. I think going back to like July of 2022, consistently seeing wage growth below average. And I, I appreciate you're not going to wade into a political question here, but those are all right to work states, where it's harder to unionize, where it's harder to organize. And what I'm wondering is, without asking you to opine on policy, have you all at the Fed done any analysis that says, as we look at where, when there are gains in labor productivity, does that gain in labor productivity, is it more likely to accrue to workers in those states where, where, where there's a stronger union presence, easier to organize, and more bargaining power for, for labor as opposed to capital? My guess is there's plenty of research around that area, not necessarily at the Fed, but we'll, we'll take a look and come back to you. Okay. All right. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired now. Go to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Timmons, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairman Powell, for being here today. We continue to appreciate your work and the work of the Federal Reserve on behalf of the American people. Uh, in August of 2023, the Federal Reserve, FDIC, and OCC released the NPR requiring the issuance of long-term debt for Category 2, 3, and 4 banks. As you may know, I, along with many of my colleagues, authored a letter to each agency expressing concerns regarding the lack of tailoring and the proposal and shortcomings in estimating the actual cost of the proposed rules. I'm concerned that these shortfalls will negatively impact lending in my district and when combined with the other ongoing regulatory proposals could, further, uh, could cause further consolidation of the banking industry. It appears that the Federal Reserve has primarily deferred to the FDIC concerning the, the proposal. Could you shed light on the Federal Reserve's role within the rulemaking process concerning the long-term debt proposal? And have you provided input regarding the proposal's interplay uh, with Basel III endgame? You know, I think we're one of the proposers of the uh, of the rule, just like the other agencies are. And you know, right now we're looking at the comments that we've gotten. That that comment period uh, 
I believe has closed. Yeah, and uh, and so we're we're you know we're very much in reading those comments as the you're in the middle of it. Fair to we say. Are. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm concerned that the long-term debt proposal's <clears throat> lack of tailoring contradicts the statutory requirements of the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act. Uh, instead of applying tailoring principles. This proposal creates category two, three, and four financial institutions identically for the purposes of long-term debt issuances. Additionally, the proposal unduly burdens category uh, two, three, and four banks by requiring them to issue long-term debt at both the parent holding company and bank level, which actually could be viewed as reverse tailoring considering GSIBs are only required to issue debt at the parent company level. Uh, what is the underlying rationale behind this dual requirement, uh, particularly when such a mandate is not imposed on our largest banks? And do you believe that this represents a tailored approach uh, as required by the statute? So that tailoring question is one of the questions we'll be asking ourselves as part of our review of the, of the comments. It, thank you. Uh, it's my understanding that Category 4 banks were not included in the original advance notice of proposed rulemaking for the long-term debt rule released in the fall of 2022. Is that your understanding as well? I didn't, I didn't catch that. Did, uh, did the advance notice that was released in the fall of 22 uh, include Category 4 banks? It's my understanding that it uh, did not. I, I can't confirm that, to be honest. I well, I think that's something that you should take into account because the Category 2 and 3 banks have had an additional year to foresee this challenge, and so Category 4 banks are uh, really behind the eight ball. And yeah, so I guess my next question is, do you believe regulatory agencies should provide smaller regional banks longer than the three-year phase-in period to meet any final long-term debt requirements? It's a good question. That's one of the comments we've gotten, and we'll, we'll be looking at that. I appreciate it. I just think if, if we're going to impose these new regulations, giving everyone the same opportunity to uh, comply with them is something worth considering. I guess one final question. If these proposed regulatory changes had been in effect prior to the fall of SVB and Signature, do you believe the outcome would have been different? Because honestly, I don't think anything would have changed. You know, it's a hypothetical. I, I'm tempt, but I'm tempted to say that if there were more, if there had been more long-term debt there ready to, that was specifically there to absorb losses. They were nowhere near being solvent. But I, I guess that's something I think y'all should take into account, whether if these proposed changes to our system that are designed to make it more resilient would have actually caused SUV and Signature to have a different outcome. Because again, um, it, it just seems that my colleagues across the aisle let no crisis go to waste. And these are changes that would not have in fact prevented the calamity that they are uh, justifying the changes based on. Um, Thank you uh, for being here today. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thanks. The gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Due to the Fed's aggressive interest rate hikes, mortgage rates have surpassed 7%, rising to 20 year highs, leaving many credit worthy and mortgage ready home buyers without a path to home ownership. This is a problem for everyone. It's an urban issue, it's a suburban issue, it's a rural issue. Chairman Powell, I, I welcome the decision of the Fed to pause rates at the end of last year. But for families in my district and across the country, that is not enough. We need the Fed to start cutting because like the rent, interest rates are too damn high. Chairman Powell, you've previously indicated that the Fed may cut rates this year. What would you expect the impact of lowering interest rates to be on the housing market specifically, including the rental purchase and construction market? So we know that higher rates, of course, have slowed down the rate of activity. So if, if uh, at, at such time as we start to lower uh, interest rates, housing market will pick up broadly across uh, new home construction and new home sales. Uh, the number, as you know, many, many households are in very low uh, rate mortgages and they really can't sell because they'd have to refinance into a high rate mortgage. That'll go away over time. So ideally, the uh, the uh, housing market would go back into a more normal phase, but one with lower inflation in the, in the broader economy. 
Right, so just to, to further reiterate that, you know, interest rate cuts would have a great benefit. Uh, just yesterday, actually, I met with a number of representatives from state housing finance agencies from throughout the country, and they were talking about the barriers to affordable housing projects given the current interest rate environment. Obviously, higher interest rates have raised costs for affordable housing developers, and many of them have chosen to slow down or halt construction entirely. So fewer homes are being built, which means fewer people are being housed. So given that we already, would you agree? So given that we already had a massive shortage of affordable housing supply prior to the pandemic, when interest rates were below 2%, the current rate, 5.5% rate, has been devastating. And the price of homes across the country have remained stubbornly high. It's clear that the current state of our housing market is impacting everyone and disproportionately hurting those who need stability the most. Does this concern you? So our job is to do price stability and maximum employment. We don't target the housing market. And uh, sorry, just, we're doing our jobs. That's what we're doing. It's, it's not something we, we want to see, but does this, this impact is the on path the housing to restoring market, but price does, stability. But does it concern you, Chairman Powell? Does it concern me? Yes, it fewer homes are being built, so fewer people are being housed. It's, this is the job we've taken on. All right, well, it concerns me greatly. Uh, Chairman Powell, the Fed's interest rate hikes have not been sufficient in addressing housing inflation. Do you agree that we need a more robust fiscal response to increase the supply of affordable housing and to lower costs nationwide? It's, yeah, I, so we don't take opinions, we don't express opinions on things like that. I will say that there's not, an, there is a structural housing shortage in the United States, and that's really the, the longer run problem. The, the problem with high interest rates is a short run problem. The longer run problem is, is lack of supply. Well, that's why it is critical that Congress pass legislation and appropriation bills that will make those necessary investments in housing for all. Um, you know, given the way that Ranking Member Waters fought for a $150 billion investment in housing uh, and build back better, I know on this side of the aisle that my colleagues and I are ready and waiting for the Republican majority to take housing inflation seriously. Housing affordability is the number one issue I'm hearing about from my constituents. Families in my district and throughout this country need relief now. I truly hope the Fed will listen to them and cut interest rates. Thank you. I yield. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Norman, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Powell. Um, I think other people have noted about the uh, crisis in the office building market across this country. That's uh, a line of work we're in. I can tell you it's real. I can tell you the the uh, uh, the, the buildings that are effectively vacant. Uh, it's going to have an effect on the taxes paid. It's going to have an effect on rents. Uh, as far as affordability in housing, you know, the rates are one thing, but my good friends on the other side of the aisle don't realize that housing is has got over 200 components to it. One of the biggest is gas prices. And as long as we're buying gas from countries that, that hate America and don't manufacture our own, housing isn't coming down. I don't know how you define affordable anyway. Um, it's, it's going to continue a downward slide. And I'm from a state in South Carolina that people are moving in. And it's, it's, um, we're not going to have the housing starts that we should have because of the policies of the Biden administration, which is train wrecking this entire economy. Um, on regulations, on Regulation 2, which is regulate, has the guardrails for credit card fees. How do you answer the, and I know the caps, are you're looking at adjusting that. How do you answer the, the charge that this is uh, really should not be, you're, you're getting in the way of banks uh, charging fees according to what their costs are? How does the regulations affect that, particular regulation too? Is this a, is this a Fed regulation we're talking about yes, or is sir. this a CFPB regulation? No, this is, for my, for my record, it's uh, the Federal Reserve uh, has finalized the routing and restrictions and proposed tighter and, and adjusting the price caps that currently exist. Is that not right? I, it doesn't ring a bell with me. It may well be right. I don't, I don't I'm not familiar. If you could look at that, I know I that all the, the credit unions and banks have, have got some concerns on I, that. I will come back to you on that. Okay, I appreciate it. Do you need a letter from us? Or no, we, no, we'll come back to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, CRA, for those of us who have been involved with banking for a long time, the regulations 
uh, having a clear set of standards that we abide by and know where to put the money to, how, when will we, should we have regulations out that we can read about what's going to be acceptable and what's not? Sorry, I didn't get your question. The regulations on C the changes in regulations for CRA. Right. What about it? I'm sorry, I missed your question. What what when, when are the regulations going to be out that we'll know, the banks will know what's acceptable for CRA and what's not acceptable? So the final, we, the final rule, of course, is out. I think we're working on, there's a lot of work to do. The requirements don't really kick in, most of them, for a couple of years at least. So I think we're working on the follow-up regulations. Okay, that's really important for a lot of the, well, all the banks because they want to make sure they qualify and where the dollars are spent. They need to make sure that it's going into the right spot because it won't, the credits won't be applied unless that's that's it. Um, the Fed now, uh, you know, where the Federal I think Reserve launched uh, and is operating this now. What how is the participation rate going with that? Slow, real slow. Um, you know, it's early days. There are network effects. You know, these things are—they go slow until until they don't. And uh, it was the same way with ACH. You may remember back in the day. Right. So we're at, we're at you know fewer than 500 banks are in there now. We're working away at it. Um, we expect it'll take some time, but we you know, but it's there, and we think it'll be beneficial. We had a lot of support from smaller banks to build it, as you know. Is the pricing below cost? I don't believe so, no, not longer okay. run cost. Okay. Um, okay, that's all the questions I have. Thank you for, for Thank being you. here. Gentleman uh, back. yields back, a gentleman from Nevada. Uh, Mr. Horsford is now recognized for five minutes. I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member uh, for this hearing and to you, Chair Powell, for appearing before the committee to discuss the recently published monetary policy report. As we continue our work on behalf of the American people, we have to keep in mind that our mission here is to grow the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. It seems as if there has been a constant series of shocks to the economy, both domestically and globally, and yet we can all see just how resilient the labor market has been as it has maintained its strength. With a robust gain of 353,000 jobs, the January numbers are a continuation of the trend that Democrats in Congress delivered through historic investments in our workforce, putting people over politics. In light of this relative economic strength, I really want to implore the Federal Reserve to take stock of the holistic economic picture before making decisions on monetary policy and to pay particular attention to those communities that have been historically left behind during times of accelerated recovery. I want to add to the questions uh, from my colleague, Congresswoman Presley, Chair Powell. At a time when, where it has become increasingly difficult for working people and people of color in particular to purchase a home, I worry that rising mortgage rates will put working families even further behind on accessing the wealth and equity that a home provides. So what actions, if any, is the Federal Reserve considering to better understand and to mitigate the impacts that your Basel III proposal may have on minority borrowers with, who disproportionately rely on high LTV mortgages due to the generational wealth gap that, pers that persists. We are, uh, we've received comments, including many, on the, on the mortgage changes, and we understand the concerns, and uh, you know, we're looking very carefully at that. Have made any decisions, but uh, you know, we will announce them when we have. Are you concerned that these shifts in risk weights will reinforce the decade-long retreat of banks from the mortgage market and push more originations to non-bank institutions? That's a question that people are raising, and it's something we take very seriously, and we'll be taking that into consideration as we, as we, as we decide about that, that change, that, that recommended change. Could you discuss why you feel it is necessary to include new requirements around operational risk in Basel III in light of recent claims that it will, it will significantly increase the cost of or prevent banks from offering altogether necessary services such as underwriting, in base investment advisory, or insurance? That is, that is one of the concerns that's been articulated about the proposed changes to operating risk. 
we take those concerns seriously. As, as I mentioned, we're in the middle of, of looking at these things and then we'll soon, we're in the process of turning uh, to, to the question of what changes to make. Well, I just would underscore the sense of urgency because the longer there's uncertainty in the market, it creates really negative effects to end users, which are all of our constituents who are looking to see these uh, costs come down. Let me shift. This Congress, under the leadership of Ranking Member Waters and former CBC Chair Joyce Beatty, I've made it a focus of my efforts to educate my colleagues and the public at large on the far-reaching benefits of increased diversity in the workplace, in our boardrooms, and in society as a whole. Despite the efforts by some on the other side to take away the very tools of economic opportunity that create inclusive work environments and improve performance, uh, there has been a really misguided assault on everything from diversity, equity, and inclusion um, to other programs uh, following the aftermath of the Supreme Court's ruling on affirmative action. So Chairman Powell, as you know, your Office of Minority and Women Inclusion uh, has a focus on this. So as we anticipate the upcoming release of your annual report on inclusion, would you be able to speak to the necessity of collecting this data that minority and women-owned businesses are included in the board's contracting and acquisition opportunities? I do believe we collect that data and we monitor that very carefully. And why is it important? Well, I, th I think um, I think diversity in the workplace is, is an important thing, and you won't know how you're doing unless you measure it. And just as the McKinsey Institute released in their Diversity Matters Even More report, companies that have more diverse management teams actually outperform companies that don't. That goes to the bottom line of our economy, and I wish my colleagues on the other side would stop their assault on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and actually work with us to grow the economy for everyone. Gentleman's time expired. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stiles, now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here, uh, Chairman Powell. Appreciate it. You're, you're navigating a, a, a difficult situation where we've had stimulative economic policies from the Biden administration in particular excessive government spending, investment in infrastructure, uh, specific tax credits. At the same time, we're seeing a regulatory environment uh, from the administration uh, that's also restricting economic growth. We've heard a lot about the Basel III endgame, uh, which you have a chair of in your opening remarks. Uh, you noted that high interest rates are impacting business investment in a negative way. High interest rates are also negatively impacting the housing market. Um, as we look at Basel III endgame, I've heard from a, a wide array of stakeholders from from those that are commenting on increase in bank capital standards, the negative impact that that would have on the housing market, as well as from the business community, the impact that that would have on their ability to invest in capital infrastructure and increase employment. Does the broad diversity of voices who hold concerns on the Basel III endgame concern you? I would say that um, I, you know I've articulated concerns, and we're we're reading those comments, and we're very much. Uh, in the process of assessing what we need to do to address them. Thank you, uh, I appreciate your, your time on that. Shifting gears slightly, as you may know, the Securities and Exchange Commission held an open meeting today to approve uh, the final climate change rule. Uh, it's a significant uh, regulation that I think would have a significant impact on the economy. Can you comment how the Fed uh, thinks about the economic impact of this new regulation or regulations more broadly, and in particular their impact on both inflation and on employment? We, we don't comment on regulations of other agencies, sorry. And will, you'll review that if it's put in place, or you'll review the economic impact as the empirical data comes forward? We, we just, we're not in the business of scoring, or, I mean, CBO does that. They'll look at it this and, and, and make a careful assessment of the economic impacts and budgetary impacts and that kind of thing. Thank, thank you. I'll shift gears again. Uh, one of your two mandates uh, is to maximize employment, and, uh, maximize employment in addition uh, to maintaining price stability. Um, and as you know, government hiring has accounted for a large share of total job creation. Uh, more than 600,000 public sector jobs uh, were created last year, and the federal government now employs nearly 3 million workers. Um, so when you're examining employment data, how does the Fed view the impact of the public sector uh, employment growth relative to private sector economic growth? In other words, how do the two data points factor into your assessment of how the broader economy is performing? So the, the um, 
jobs are jobs, right? But I think we, we would tend to look at private sector jobs to get a better assessment. Private sector job creation is a better indicator of kind of the, the private sector momentum in the economy. But we look at both. I mean, they both count. And, and does the dramatic increase in the in the private sector number of jobs uh, give you any pause or concern as it relates to? You mean in the public sector? In the public sector. Sorry if I misspoke. Yes, the public sector. I, you know, the, the truth is the the public sector was unable to hire at the beginning because the, because wages went up a lot in the private sector at the beginning of the pandemic inflation and. and Public sector can't respond to that. So there's some catch-up hiring going on there now. Now that things are settling down to normal, I think there's some catch-up hiring. I, I'm not sure it's a, it's a, it's an issue we, we're concerned about. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll shift gears in my in my final minute uh, just to talk a little bit to get your perspective on the macroeconomic developments uh, that are having an impact on our monetary policy. Specifically, as we think about the potential for a productivity boom from AI to work at home to other factors, um, we're, the data is probably too early to tell whether or not we're having a true uh, productivity view. But how does the Fed view uh, the the adoption of some of these new technologies, in particular AI, as it relates to labor productivity? So everyone's looking at, at uh, AI for that question, and um, uh, it's hard to say, actually. It's, it's, we've had really nice productivity in the last year or so, but it's probably still very much affected by the post-pandemic factors that we're seeing. Uh, I think we need to see more to understand whether there is a longer-term boom. AI certainly has the, the, the capacity to either augment labor or to replace labor, and that's a key question. We really don't know which of the two it will do. There are tons of money being invested in it, and so it's likely to drive significant productivity. I would say right now technology, but also um, uh, higher labor mobility, uh, you know, a lot of people quitting during the really tight labor market, and also the, uh, the, the, the rise in startups. You know, there were a lot of people starting companies during the pandemic. Those, those are the kind of things that, that do add up to higher productivity over time. So there is hope that we'll see some productivity out of this. Thanks for your comments today, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We'll go to the last question of the day. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Torres, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, I have several questions about some of the most common complaints that I've heard about Basel III Endgame. Um, I have an open mind on the subject, but I want to hear your response to some of the arguments that have been leveled against it. Uh, first, the Fed has repeatedly reassured the public that the banking system is well capitalized, yet the Fed is advancing Basel III on the assumption that the banking system is undercapitalized. So the first question is, how do you reconcile the Fed's repeat assurances about a well-capitalized banking system with Basel III's assumption of an undercapitalized banking system? The second question, if the purpose of Basel III is to align U.S. banks with their banking peers elsewhere in the world, why is the Fed imposing requirements that are more stringent than those prescribed by Basel III? In other words, why is the Fed, quote, unquote, gold plating? Uh, the third question is, how do you reconcile Basel III's recommendation for standardization with Congress's statutory requirement for tailoring? Standardization would seem to be in conflict or in tension with regulatory tailoring. And the fourth and final question, do you think that Basel III could have the unintended consequence of reinforcing the trend toward shadow banking, which would mean less regulation, not more? Is there a sense in which we are transferring risk from the regulated sector of the financial system to the deregulated sector. So I bombarded you with four questions, and I'll give you the time you need to answer them. I'm going to have a hard time reading my handwriting here, but I'll start with yes to the fourth one. I'll give you that one, because uh, that, that is clearly a risk. Um, we've, we've seen uh, inter intermediation activity moving out of the uh, regulated system, and, and this has the risk of doing more of that. Um, so, so what was, in a word or two, what was the one again? Just the, you, you said, you testified oh, and yeah, yes, yeah. repeat reassurances about the capitalization of the banks. So I, I addressed this in my remarks in the open yeah. board meeting, you know, uh, higher capital is, is always going to add to safety and soundness, but there's a cost. Right. And so identifying the precise, pre precise right level is very, very difficult and hard, hard to be, to do it objectively. I've said for years in these rooms that I thought that the level of capital in, in, the, in the U.S. banking system was about right. So I posed, and I voted for all these increases yeah. during by Dodd-Frank, so I think it's a very fair question. We'll be looking at that. The second one was? Uh, the concern about gold plating. About? Gold plating? Oh, gold plating, yeah. No, it, it is, and I said this in my public remarks, yeah. that 
uh, we're exceeding the minimums with this proposal, and we also exceeded what the other big jurisdictions are doing. And so that's a question. That's that's a good question. I'll, I'll agree. Okay, great. And the third, and the third is, um, I think you more or less and standardization versus tailoring. Standardization of. Um, it was something. Specific. Yeah. So, so Congress passed a statute oh, requiring you, regulatory tailoring. tailoring. No, that's, that's and, an and do you think question. Basel III is in compliance with that statute? I addressed that in my comments yeah. too. I, I, I think you're, you're, you're right. We, we do need to take on board the lessons of Silicon Valley Bank yeah. as it relates to the smaller, large banks, but we don't need to throw away the tailoring that's required by by the law, but also that is appropriate if we're going to have a diverse banking system. You know, the collapse of SBB was largely a story. It was largely a story about liquidity risk and interest rate risk. Yet the focal points of Basel III are credit risk, market rate risk, and operational risk. Like, what is your response to the criticism that the Fed should focus its energies on addressing the forms of risk that were responsible for the SVB bank failure, rather than focusing on forms of risk that were largely unrelated to it? So I, I agree with that, but but I would say we are we are working on a package of liquidity uh, measures which is directly, which directly addresses uh, the Silicon Valley Bank situation. We've also taken a lot of supervisory actions with other medium and small sized banks that had a lot of uninsured deposits and a lot of real estate risk and things like that. So we've been doing quite a lot on the supervisory section that it doesn't require new rules. Uh, and then finally, you know, as you know, the, the crippling cost of housing accounts for a third of inflation. One of the most powerful tools for producing and preserving affordable housing is the low-income housing tax credit, which has financed nearly 4 million units of affordable housing. The, the banking system accounts for 85% of LIHTC investments. And there's a concern that Basel III, in its present form, would diminish the availability of LIHTC and the amount of affordable housing development. And so I'm just curious, is that on your radar, and is that something you're willing to examine? Yes, okay. it is. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Gentlemen, as uh, yields back, that's the final question of the day. We committed to the chair that would be done with a hard stop by 1 p.m. It's nice when we can honor our commitments. So I'd like to thank Chair Powell for his testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days with, in which to submit additional written questions to the, uh, uh, to the wit for the witness to the chair. The questions will be forwarded to the witness for his response. I ask you, Chair Powell, uh, please respond as promptly as you possibly can. Uh, and with that, this hearing is adjourned. All right, everybody. That, of course, is Fed Chair Jay Powell finishing up the first of two days of his semiannual monetary policy testimony up on Capitol Hill. A very good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to an extended version of Bloomberg Business Week live on radio, TV, YouTube, and Bloomberg Originals on this Fed Wednesday. A lot going on. I'm Carol Master along with Tim Stenovic. And uh, welcome, everyone, because uh, Wall Street, I think it's safe to say, Tim, breathing a bit of uh, a sigh of relief, if you will, because it feels like we pretty much got the same message of very similar one uh, from Jay Powell that we got from the last FOMC meeting. Yeah, I think that's true. A strong economy is going to keep officials on hold for now, though he does expect the Federal Reserve to cut rates this year. Meantime, Carol, as this was all happening, mm -hmm. we, are, we were watching shares of uh, New York Community Bank Corp because they were tumbling on a Wall Street Journal report that the bank is trying to raise equity capital. At one point, it was down as much as 47%. Shares now halted uh, pending news. All right, so that's all front and center on this Wednesday. We're also waiting in just a couple Couple of minutes, uh, the beige book from the Federal Reserve, from those regional Fed banks. Uh, in the meantime, let's get an update on the trade. Let's head on over to Charlie Pellet with a check on that and your top business stories. Hey, Charlie. Hi, thank you very much. Indeed, lots of moving parts to this market. We've got you covered right to the numbers now with stocks in the green, very close to session highs right now on the S&P 500 index, up 41 at 51.20. We're looking at a gain right now of 8 tenths of 1%. Dow Industrials up 174 now, higher by 5 tenths of 1%. The NASDAQ Composite Index up 157, a gain right now of 1%. Ten-year yielding 4.09% with a two-year right now at 4.53%. Spot gold higher by eight-tenths of 1%, 21,044 on gold. West Texas Intermediate Crude WTI now with an 80 handle. WTI up 2.4% right now. And Bitcoin 67,245 up by 6.2%. New York Community Bank. 
Bancorp trying to raise equity capital to help restore confidence in the beleaguered company. That, according to the Wall Street Journal, citing sources, a trading halt on NYCB down last trade by 42.4 percent. And finally, Deutsche Bank has cut the bonus pool at its investment banking division by more than 10 percent after a slump in deals and a slowdown in trading last year. Again, recapping, Powell speaks, stocks higher, S&P right now up 41. That is a gain of eight tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It is indeed. All right, Charlie Pellet, thank you so much. Carol Master along with Tim Stenovic live here in our Bloomberg studio at Bloomberg headquarters. Obviously, the main event is what we just heard from Fed Chair Jay Powell up on Capitol Hill. Charlie breaking down some of those key points. Um, the Fed Chair reiterated to lawmakers at the U.S. Central Bank, no rush to cut interest rates. I feel like, Tim, we got a little bit of, my, uh, of everything. And the Fed Chair really pointing out the importance of not going too soon and also not going too late in terms of making moves to cut rates. Yeah, here's what he said. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. Um, he repeated language used at his last press conference just at the end of January. He also repeated his claim from the January press conference that rate cuts are likely to be appropriate at some point this year. And, you know, I think the market's reaction